Halloween is easily the best holiday. The spooky time of year where the leaves change, the weather's just right, and it's socially acceptable to watch movies where Juana Man gets murdered while taking a dump in a porta potty. Damn enchiladas! Or it's the time of year where you get your pumpkin spice lattes if you're basic, which I am. Damn good coffee. Whether you're dressing up as your favorite IP to beg strangers for candy, or dressing up to impress a boyfriend free sweetheart at a party, I feel like Halloween just appeals to everyone. But let's go ahead and take a moment to set the mood. And what better way to get the atmosphere right than with a little music? And luckily, I know just the guy. All right, Daniel, it'd be awesome if you wrote me a little Halloween jingle for my video. Yeah, of course, I wrote a little something new and I think you're gonna like it. Let's hear it. Stop, that's clearly John Carpenter's Halloween theme. Really? I actually got inspired from what I've done by Linkin Park and came up with that, so. Spooky, huh? Daniel, I think you're the one person on Earth that's incapable of being spooky. I can be spooky. But I feel like that segues perfectly into today's video. John Carpenter's Halloween. It's one of my favorite horror movies of all time, and is quintessential viewing for this time of year, for obvious reasons. The same cannot be said for a number of its sequels, most of them ranging from bad to downright embarrassing. Trick or treat. Motherfucker. So I figured, what better way to celebrate the season and the release of Halloween Ends, which ironically is not going to be the last film according to the producers, than to review, then rank, all 13 films in the Halloween franchise. Because that's just what I do. Turn my pain into content. No one was forcing me to do this. I didn't. Whatever. <laughs> well, I underestimated how long this would take. I started making this stupid video in early October, thinking I can get it out by Halloween, not thinking about how long it would take to talk about 13 movies. I thought it was gonna be like Friday the 13th where there's 12 of them, but there's like a general sameness. They're all bad for the same reason. But Halloween has 13 movies that are all pretty bad for very different reasons. But here we are in February. Happy Halloween! Yay! Luckily, we're starting off pretty strong with John Carpenter's original classic. Well, maybe not so lucky, because what do I say that hasn't already been said? Carpenter and co-writer Deborah Hill created a story that may be simple, but it's elevated simply by the craft in which it's told. For those of you who don't know, Halloween tells the tale of Michael Myers, a deranged serial killer who murders his older sister Judith when he is only six years old. And after escaping Smith's Grove Sanitarium 15 years later, it's up to the only person who knows Michael well enough, his psychiatrist Dr. Samuel Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance, to hunt him down. A killing or five later, Michael comes mask to face with babysitter and final girl Lori Strode, portrayed by Jamie Lee Curtis in her first role. Originally conceived as The Babysitter Murders, Carpenter, Hill, and producer Mustafa Akkad decided to set the film on Halloween to quote Carpenter, Halloween Night. It has never been the theme in a film. Whether or not that's true is up for debate, but it's since become the most iconic film set around the holiday. Hell, even the score, composed by Carpenter himself, has become synonymous with the holiday outside of the film. So much of what makes this movie work is the careful direction, the slow burn pacing, accentuated by cinematographer Dean Cundey's masterful use of the 235 aspect ratio. He uses the negative space to make the audience feel not just a alone and helpless, but to force your eyes to scour the screen for where Michael Myers, the shape, might be hiding. Now I'm sure everyone and their mother knows that the iconic Michael Myers mask is actually just a William Shatner Captain Kirk mask painted white with darkened hair and cut open eye holes, and that Haddonfield is not a real place in suburban Illinois. However, there is a real Haddonfield in New Jersey, where co-writer Deborah Hill is from. Despite the setting, Halloween was not shot in Illinois. In fact, it was shot right here in Pasadena. Now this isn't the original house's location, they moved it a couple of years back, but it's awesome that it's still intact. This right here was the location for the hardware store where Michael stole his iconic mask. And if you go right over there, that's where they moved the Myers house. 
You'll notice in the movie that all the leaves are green, yet there's a ton of dead leaves on the ground. That's because John Carpenter and the crew had trash bags full of dead leaves, and they would scatter them on the ground, they would film whatever they need to film, and when they would do a reverse shot, they would have to pick up the leaves, put them back into the bag, move to the next area, and scatter them on the ground again. Movie magic. It's worth mentioning that, again, despite the setting, none of the Halloween films were shot in Illinois. The first three, as well as H2O and the remake, were shot all over California. Four through six were shot in Salt Lake City, Utah. Resurrection was shot in Vancouver. The remake sequel was shot in Georgia. And the new trilogy was shot in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, respectively. You'd think, after 13 films, at least one of them would have been shot in Illinois. Jesus, I just remembered I watched 13 of these stupid fucking movies. Speaking of stupid, as much as I love the first Halloween, it's not without its flaws. Like, how does Michael, who's been incarcerated since he was six, know how to drive a car? For God's sakes, he can't drive a car! He was doing very well last night! Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. Well, in one of the sequels, that becomes idiotically possible. And I think everyone hates when Lori constantly drops the knife after she thinks she's defeated Michael. Furthermore, a lot of the dialogue isn't very well written. I hate a guy with a car and no sense of humor. I'll be totally wiped out. I don't think you have enough to do tomorrow. Totally. You guys think I'm too smart. I don't. I think you're wacko. Now you're seeing men behind bushes. And I don't like this insinuation that this guy's gonna rip this little girl girl's clothes off. Then you rip my clothes off, then we rip Lindsay's clothes off. Yeah, I think I got it. Totally. I actually never noticed that line until my most recent rewatch of the film for this review, and yeah, it's kind of a Nicky line. Also, as effective as the kills are in this, that character's comeuppance physically doesn't make any sense. What with him being pinned up on the wall by a kitchen knife. But whatever, it's still a cool visual nonetheless. And it's far more forgiving here than in all the sequels that try to replicate it. It also wasn't until my most recent rewatch that I watched this as just a John Carpenter movie. Let me explain. Since I was born, all the way to 2018, Halloween was a multi-film franchise, and it was just public knowledge that Michael Myers and Laurie Strode were brother and sister, as revealed in the sequel. That's Strode, girl. Michael Myers' sister. So I always watched the first Halloween with the knowledge that they were related, and that's why Michael came after her. And I'll go deeper about what John Carpenter feels about that when I talk about Halloween 2. But earlier this year, I watched every John Carpenter film, with this one just being one of his many works outside of it being part of a franchise. And watching it as a standalone, it's genuinely more effective. It's so much creepier with Michael having no motive and just stalking his prey with no reasoning. It also makes Loomis's speech about Michael being blank, pale, and emotionless with the devil's eyes so much more captivating. The ending is also more effective when you view this as a standalone film, with Loomis shooting Michael only for him to disappear into the night, the camera cutting to where he's been or where he might be, Michael's heavy breathing under the mask. And who knows? Maybe he'll come for you next. Released in 1978, Halloween is actually not the first slasher. It owes a lot to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and Bob Clark's Black Christmas, sharing a character name of one of the protagonists of the former and the holiday-themed stalker horror of the latter. The difference is Halloween was an unprecedented success, making $70 million on a budget of only about 300000 making it one of the most successful independent films of all time. So as much as we can thank John Carpenter for essentially providing the soundtrack for the season, we can also thank him for inadvertently starting the slasher craze of the 1980s, consisting of self-proclaimed rip-offs like Friday the 13th, and some of the crappy sequels we'll get into later. But on its own, it's a spooky little movie, even if it is a bit dated. I watch it every year, and I'll continue to watch it for years to come. What can I say? It's a classic. Three years later, we got Halloween 2. And right off the bat, it feels like a movie that nobody wanted to make. And that's because it was a movie 
that nobody wanted to make, save for the producers and Universal, who acquired the rights after the original film was a smash hit. Though John Carpenter helped shepherd the film, Halloween 2 is directed by Rick Rosenthal, a name that we'll hear again a bit later in the video. When writing the sequel, Carpenter and Deborah Hill found difficulty telling more of the Michael Myers story, believing that there was no more story to tell. Co-editor of the original, and later Halloween 3 director Tommy Lee Wallace states, no one thought of sequels when making the 1978 film. And on the script writing process, Carpenter claims it mainly dealt with a lot of beer, sitting in front of a typewriter saying, what the fuck am I doing? I don't know. The film takes place on the same night as the original, beginning during the previous film's climax with Loomis shooting Michael seven times. I shot him six times! Well, maybe you did in the last movie, but here, I definitely heard seven shots. <laughs> Maybe you missed one of them? At point blank range? Anyway, Michael continues his killing spree as Loomis desperately continues to hunt for his former patient. Lori is then taken to the hospital, where she'll be for the remainder of the movie. Most of the original cast and crew returned, save for Carpenter directing, though he did return to score the film and write as previously mentioned. Nick Castle, who portrayed Michael Myers in the first film, is also absent, going on to become a filmmaker in his own right, co-writing Escape from New York with John Carpenter, and directing the Dennis the Menace movie. Okay. This time, Michael is portrayed by stuntman Dick Warlock, and nothing against him, but the physicality of the character just feels off. He's a bit stockier, and the mask, even though it is the same prop as the original, is a lot more ill-fitting on his face. As far as pros go, Dean Cundy returns as cinematographer, making the movie look and feel much like the first one, and Carpenter's score continues to be awesome. Though I'm not crazy about the new orchestration of the main theme. Most of the film's shortcomings fall with the writing and pacing. There's simultaneously very little going on, and too much much. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. The majority of the movie takes place at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, where Laurie is taken, and follows the unlikable hospital staff as they're picked off one by one when Michael shows up. The kills are a lot more gruesome this time around. By today's standards, they're still pretty tame. But compared to the first film, it's just strange jumping to this level of gore. Apparently, this was Carpenter's idea, believing that the original cut of the film wasn't scary, and implemented more violent and gorier scenes after after the fact, causing director Rosenthal to proclaim it ruined my carefully paced film. And speaking of kills, Ben Tramer, the crush that Laurie mentions in the first film, is seemingly murdered here due to him wearing a costume similar to Michael's. Wait, hold on. Michael stole his mask from a hardware store in the first movie, which explains why Tramer is wearing a similar mask while out trick-or-treating. But why is he wearing the coveralls, too? Michael stole those from what I believe was a traveling mechanic, so this isn't a costume. Is it? I don't know. The point is, it's weird. Furthermore, I can't go on without mentioning the dumb twist. Marion, the nurse who is driving Loomis to the sanitarium and gets her car stolen in the first film, returns to tell Loomis the shocking truth. Michael Myers and Laurie Strode are siblings! <laughs> I hate this. And so does John Carpenter, who regretfully explains that he only wrote this stupid twist because he was drunk. It makes Michael feel more calculated and sets up a convoluted continuity down the line. What's also strange about this half-assed twist is that it's eerily similar to what George Lucas did to Luke and Leia in Return of the Jedi, which came out two years later. Coincidence? I think so. Speaking of convoluted continuity, Michael writes in blood on a school chalkboard. Sam Hain. Okay. First off, it's pronounced Samhain. But secondly, this movie implies, albeit half-acidly, that Michael is killing due to a Celtic ritual? Right after showing us his little Chris Chan drawing of his family with a knife through it? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. The ending is admittedly pretty cool. Laurie shoots out Michael's eyes, giving us the iconic imagery of his bleeding mask. As Michael blindly swipes at her, Laurie and Loomis fill the room with gas, Loomis sacrificing himself to end the evil once and for all. It's time, Michael. Whoa! 
Carpenter went full Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 on us and tried to definitively kill off Michael and Loomis. The man's got balls. Michael does emerge from the fire, gaining 30 pounds in the process, before succumbing to the flames, his body reducing to ash. Overall, it's not a great movie. I struggle even calling it a good movie. Laurie has nothing to do, and Loomis begins his downward spiral into madness. But visually, it's alright. And the music and atmosphere definitely make it worth a watch. I'm ranking this one under the original. No surprise there. Next up, we got Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, a little under a year later in 1982. Alright, controversial opinion time. I fucking love Halloween 3. Is that even controversial anymore? Either way, it's definitely divisive, especially at the time. After the financial success of Halloween 2, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill would only agree to another entry if they veered away from Michael Myers and tried something new. The plan? Turn the Halloween franchise into an anthology. The idea was to have every movie share the central theme of the holiday, but tell their own unique stories. They were even open to the idea of having those stories get their own sequels, like Halloween 2. In retrospect, it feels like we missed out on such a cool concept. Tommy Lee Wallace, who left the production of Halloween 2 over creative differences, signed on to direct Halloween 3, stating, It was our intention to create an anthology out of the series, sort of along the lines of Night Gallery or The Twilight Zone, only on a much larger scale, of course. Though uncredited, John Carpenter returns to co-write with Wallace and scores the movie as well, along with Halloween 2 musical collaborator Alan Howarth. Dean Cundy also returns as cinematographer, stylistically tying the film to the previous two. Speaking of style, something I forgot to talk about when discussing the first two films are the opening credit sequences. The original Halloween features a jack-o'-lantern, slowly zooming in on its eye, which somewhat resembles Michael's mask, its nose being his knife. Halloween 2 also features a jack-o'-lantern, but this time being pulled apart and revealing a skull that they probably got from the Dollar Tree. This time, it's a jack-o'-lantern slowly revealing itself on a television screen, setting up the reoccurring TV jingle motif. Oh, right, the jingle. Love or hate Halloween 3, the Silver Shamrock jingle is gonna get stuck in your head. It's so simple, it's just the London Bridges tune, but it's just as creepy as it is annoying. It's effective. The whole point is that it's getting into children's heads, like the manipulative commercials of the 1980s. I can't believe I've gotten this far without discussing the plot, because the plot is insane. Let's see, where do I start? So, there's this mysterious novelty company in Northern California called Silver Shamrock, whose current specialty is the big Halloween 3 masks. See what they did there? After this frenzied man shows up at a gas station holding one of the masks, raving about how they're gonna kill us all, he's brought to the hospital where we meet the film's unlikely lead, Dr. Dan Chalice, played by John Carpenter regular Tom Atkins. After the man is murdered and the murderer blows himself up, Dr. Chalice and the murdered man's daughter Ellie begin to investigate the mask company, who's secretly stolen a piece of Stonehenge to harness some of its dark magic, and put little pieces of Stonehenge into the chips on the back of the masks to turn the children's heads into bugs, because the company's owner, the evil immortal Irishman Connell Cochran, wants to sacrifice children to bring Halloween back to its Celtic roots of the Festival of Samhain. You kinda just have to go with it. Let's put it this way. It's part Stephen King, part Body Snatchers, but it's all insanity. And that's kinda what I like about it. It's different. It doesn't all work. For one, Dr. Chalice and Ellie's romance is highly questionable, with him being old enough to be her dad. Not to mention this all happens days after her dad is killed. Maybe it's a daddy issues thing? Also, Dr. Chalice tends to hit on every woman he works with, and the way he's written before he makes it to the factory kinda makes him hard to sympathize with. Fortunately, he's played by Tom Atkins, who's just a warm, affable presence, so that helps. None of my critiques have to do with the lack of Michael Myers. But that's where the movie failed, at least at the time. 
Because Halloween 2 followed the original and followed the same characters, it set a precedent to the general public that this franchise was about Michael Myers. In retrospect, Tommy Lee Wallace explains, Halloween 3 should never have been called Halloween 3. It should have simply been called Season of the Witch. But then you see, it never would have gotten made. And it's a real shame because Halloween 3 is so much fun. And it actually feels like a movie about Halloween, maybe even more than the previous two. Dan O'Herlihy, who would later appear in two of my favorite projects, Robocop and Twin Peaks, is excellent as Connell Cochran, providing a nuanced, menacing performance, his accent fluctuating between a warm British and an ominous Irish when explaining his evil plot. Ominous Irish, that's something I never thought I'd say. It was the start of the year in our old Celtic lands and we'd be waiting in our houses of wattles and clay. The barriers would be down, you see, between the real and the unreal. And the dead might be looking in to sit by our fires of turf. Halloween. The festival of Samhain. What's crazy too, is that he kinda gets away with it. After Cochrane becomes one with Stonehenge, which I think is what's happening, it's really odd. Chalice goes back to the gas station from the beginning of the film, mirroring Ellie's dad's urgency. He calls for the Silver Shamrock commercials to be pulled from the three channels. Remember, this was 1982. There were only three channels. And he successfully gets the first two pulled. However, with the commercial still running on the third channel, he desperately pleads for them to pull it. Stop it, please, for God's sake, please stop. It. There's no more time. You've got us. Please stop it. Stop it now. Turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 I'm gonna have to use that clip in some of these later entries. While promoting Starman, John Carpenter would remark, I thought Halloween 3 was excellent. I really like that film because it's different. It has a real nice feel to it. I think mm -hmm. he's a talented director. On the other hand, I think Halloween 2 is, is an abomination and a horrible movie. And I couldn't agree more, at least in regard to Halloween 3. It's deservedly garnered a cult following in recent years, fans considering it underrated and an anomaly of what could have been. As for me, I'm ranking this one as a close second. The first one is undeniably better, but it's leagues more entertaining than Halloween 2. Hell, I even own the silver shamrock masks. They're glow in the dark too. But in 1982, without the benefit of hindsight, fan outcry and low box office reception made it inevitable for the old Shatner clad killer to re appear if they only knew that bringing Michael back would not equate to quality. After the apparent failure of Halloween 3, it would be a whole six years before we saw Halloween 4 The Return of Michael Myers in 1988. Coinciding with the 10th anniversary of the original, it was the first reboot in a long line of reboots later down the line. Joe Dante, the director of The Burbs and Gremlins, was John Carpenter's choice to direct Halloween 4, though the project ultimately went to Dwight Little, the director of the Tekken movie. Okay. Carpenter and Deborah Hill were involved in the early stages of the film, Carpenter even enlisting author Dennis Etchison, who wrote the novelizations of the first three films, before being turned away, their ideas being, get this, too cerebral. Yeah, come on, we're making these movies for dummies! And while we're at it, can we stop using those Roman numerals? Halloween IV? Well, we are only four films in and it already feels like this franchise is on life support. Right off the bat, you're gonna notice a considerable downgrade. There's no studio logo, as Universal was no longer distributing, and we're just thrown into the movie. Credit where credit is due, the creepy atmosphere during the titles kind of works, seeing a quiet, small town's Halloween decorations. But what's really throwing me off is the aspect ratio. Cinematographer Dean Cundy did not return for Halloween 4, his career having taken off significantly, providing his talents to Back to the Future and and who framed Roger Rabbit, which came out the same year as this. He was instead replaced by Peter Lyons Collister, the same cinematographer behind such classics as The Master of Disguise, Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo, and my personal favorite Illumination film, Hop. 
As a result, the 235 aspect ratio is instead replaced by a standard widescreen, which loses the charm of the original three. Also, the Halloween score doesn't kick in until after the opening credits, this time composed solely by Alan Howarth. But how do they bring Michael back to life, I'm sure you're wondering? <laughs> I'm mad you asked. This creepy, bloated, Elijah Wood-looking guard explains that after Loomis, Got him six times! that the two of them nearly burned to death. Hmm. Hmm. So Michael's been comatose ever since, until hearing that he has a niece. Then he wakes up to begin his new killing spree. <laughs> Oh, and now he's inhumanly strong, I guess. Jamie Lee Curtis is also absent from this film, so her character was just unceremoniously killed off screen. And instead, we follow her eight-year-old daughter, Jamie. See what they did there? What's kind of refreshing is that, even though she's adopted like Lori, Jamie and her stepsister Rachel share a loving bond, instead of the writers taking the easy way out to create some sort of contrived conflict. However, after looking at a promotional still from the first film, Jamie begins to see visions of her murderous uncle. Oh, right. We should probably talk about this film's god-awful mask. He looks like he's permanently shocked. Can I do that? Within the narrative, it is a different mask, as we see him stealing a new one. But it looks so goddamn cheap. I guess behind the scenes, this was made using the same William Shatner mask. But why the fuck did they fill in the eyebrows? I mean, it's better than later in the movie, where they forgot to paint it and Michael Myers turns pink. What, did they think we wouldn't know? Notice? Also, his proportions seem a little off. Like he's got no neck, a tiny head, and very broad shoulders and hips. He just looks so goofy. Unlike the original, where he assembles his ensemble off screen, here you see every step of how he does it. Like, do we really need to see that? I actually don't mind his bandaged look, but I get it. After Halloween 3, they didn't want to take any chances. Donald Pleasance actually does return for this film, and despite having survived a fucking explosion and only having a widow scar on his face, he still brings it, even if he is a little more over the top. He's over the top with class. It's just funny that even after everything that happened 10 years prior, nobody listens to Loomis. What isn't brought, however, is the script, which in a lot of ways is just a beat for beat retread of the first one. Michael escapes, Loomis pursues, Michael kills and probably eats a dog, Jamie survives. There's not a whole lot to it. Jamie is even teased similarly to Tommy Doyle, but here it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Ha ha, your uncle's the reason we don't sleep at night. Ha 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 ha, cringe. Some of the kills are also recreated, like the dumb wall kill. But this time, the twist is that it's with a gun? Somehow that makes even less sense. There's a fun little side plot of a bunch of townsfolk learning about Michael's return to Haddonfield, and they form a lynch mob to defeat him. What's funny is that these hillbillies are so trigger happy that they accidentally kill the wrong guy. But when Jamie and Rachel are in trouble, they do the smart thing and try to get them to safety. In the end, Rachel runs Michael over with a truck. Jamie holds his slightly burned hand before the police just shoot the shit out of him. Loomis and the police return Rachel and Jamie home, and Loomis remarks that Michael Myers is in hell. Buried. Where he belongs. I don't know. You Got shot him six th times and then blew him up, and he survived that. The film ends with a bit of a twist. We see, in first person, someone grabbing a pair of scissors and putting on a mask, and killing the stepmother as she prepares a bath, similar to the opening scene of the original film. And when screams are heard upstairs, Loomis and Rachel look up to see that the murderer is Jamie. Which, spoilers, they really don't follow up on in Halloween 5. And it's a twist directly stolen from Friday the 13th parts 4 and 5. It's just really weird that we've gotten to the point where they're copying their own ripoff. Overall, Halloween 4 is... fine. It's a contrived carbon copy of the first film, with elements of the second, and not a whole lot of anything else to keep it engaging. Like I said, I liked the loving sister dynamic, and little Danielle Harris is an incredible child actress as Jamie, but I can't rank this above any of the previous three. There's just not enough here for me to recommend. 
it's mostly boring. I was so bored, in fact, that I didn't even realize that this character is supposed to be Lindsay Wallace from the first film. It's actually here that my friend Jeremy stopped watching the Halloween movies with me, because we both agreed that it was here that it became just another slasher franchise. If someone has never seen a Halloween film, this is probably what most people think they're like. Now we have Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. And I have my chance to get my revenge on this movie, because this one was fucking bad. First off, they don't follow up on Jamie being the new killer. They pull a Friday the 13th Part 5 and have her under medical surveillance. I guess she did stab her stepmom, but only because she now shares a psychic link with Michael? That's so stupid. Like, I kind of liked that Michael was vaguely supernatural in the original film, but I hate it when it's this blatant. <laughs> Cookie woman. Dale's gas station, 5th and Main. Halloween 4, I guess, reinvigorated the franchise financially enough that they rushed Halloween 5 into theaters just shy of a year later in 1989. And it shows. The direction is sloppy, this time, by Dominic, or Dominique, uh, um this guy, who wanted to make the audience relate more to Michael Myers. Why the fuck would you want to do that? The whole reason he's scary is because he's an unstoppable killing machine with no motive. I don't want to see him cry. Actually, I don't want to see him at all in this movie. Shouldn't he be dead? Well, the way they elaborate on the previous film, he definitely should be, because they added a shot of a cop throwing a stick of dynamite. Miraculously, he escapes, and is nursed back to health by some hobo Michael just ends up killing and... Oh god, the mask. So, this was the first time they didn't use a Captain Kirk mask, and instead, they used a mold of makeup artist Greg Nicotero's face. And if the mask in the previous film looked too innocent, this mask looks way too angry. Which I guess was the director's intention? Loomis, whose craziness is amped up to 11 this go around, tries to exploit Jamie's psychic link with Michael to stop him. And he explains that Jamie could possibly stop the rage. The rage inside. Remember in the first one when Loomis said that Michael had this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes? The devil's eyes. Yeah, instead of having nothing left, there's still rage. What anger? That's not scary. And what sucks is that this is not even the last time we see an angry Michael. But I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Rachel is unceremoniously killed off, being one of the only aspects I actually liked about the previous film. Instead, she's replaced by this character, Tina, who's nowhere near as likable. She's built up to be the final girl, but dies in an especially unsatisfying way. Well, none of the kills are satisfying in this movie. I was at least hoping, with as stupid as this franchise quickly became, at least we'd have some decent kills. But no, they're so lame and trite, when they're not just aping off a of Friday the 13th. Even the set pieces, like the barn, and oh come on, even the pitchfork? That's directly stealing from Friday the 13th Part 3. Way to steal from the worst one. Hey, hey, no, 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 man. Is that Billiam? There's also this awful out-of-place comedy in here with these cops. The music playing these goofy rubber ducky sounds whenever they show up. All clear. Nothing above, nothing below. And it all falls flat. Everything in this movie falls flat. Because it's so... Boring. There's a scene where Michael is trying to mow down Jamie with a car that felt so much like the climax, I was actually getting excited for the movie to end. But then I pressed the start button and saw that there was an entire half hour of the movie left. The actual climax takes place at the Myers estate, I don't really feel comfortable calling it a house. Okay, look, I can handle bad movies. I've seen a lot of them, but this is the fourth sequel to one of the greatest movies of all time, and it feels like they're just getting everything wrong. The mask is wrong, the motive is wrong, every decision is wrong. In the original two films, the Myers house was just a normal, decrepit house. One that you could find in any neighborhood. Which is what makes it scary, that you could have a Myers house in your town. Uh, what the fuck is that? We just had a distress call from the clinic. They haven't been able to reach them again. Wait, what the fuck? There were four men up there. It looks like one of ours, it's a code two. Hey! <laughs> ah! 
That's some of the worst ADR I've ever heard in a movie. And I've seen Loquisha. I got a smartphone. But you said you hate smartphones. Okay, maybe it's not that bad. As I said before, Loomis tries to reason with Michael, which goes about as well as Ben Tramer's Halloween. <laughs> When we're given the only decent scene in the movie, Jamie is trying to escape Michael in this dumb waiter thing, with Michael stabbing through it, barely missing her every time. It's pretty tense, and most of the movie, again, is on little Danielle Harris's shoulders. When she does make it to the top, Jamie finds Michael's murder shrine, complete with Rachel's body, and yet another dead dog. Okay, so in the first film, when Sheriff Brackett and Dr. Loomis enter the Myers house, they see the remains of a dead dog dog off screen, to which Loomis replies, he got hungry. And for whatever reason, they just turned that into Michael's food of choice in the sequels. It's such a little detail in the first movie, I can't believe, out of everything they could have carried over, that's what they felt was important. Loomis then, completely out of character, decides to use Jamie as bait to lure Michael into a trap. Michael's then tranked, then beaten by Loomis with a wooden plank. Yup, after getting shot at more than six times at this point, and being blown up twice, that's what's gonna stop Michael Myers. A wooden plank. Michael is then arrested, still wearing his mask in the jail cell, before this mysterious man in black, who's been unexplained throughout the movie, shows up and breaks him out. Jamie wanders in to discover the chaos, and Michael missing from his cell. But who is this man in black? <laughs> You're really gonna regret asking that question. Wow, I hated this movie. This is going at the bottom of my ranking, no doubt. Whereas Halloween 2 and Halloween 4 left me disappointed, Halloween 5 left me angry. This might be one of the worst horror movies of all time, and I look forward to never watching it again. One last thing before I move on is that the theatrical posters for Halloween 4 and Halloween 5 use the exact same picture of this mask, but this mask is it used in either of these movies? Talk about false advertising. This mask looks better than the one that's in this movie. It's better and it's not even real. All right, I gotta cool down. There wasn't another Halloween film for six years. The rights being acquired by Dimension Films and... Wait, what the fuck? Really? We're doing this bit? All right, Jeremy, you can come in now. Hey, Matt, what's up? Well, wait a minute, if it's not you, then who is it? Could be me. Well, no, it can't be you. You just volunteered yourself. Sure it could. Well, no, look at look at that guy's stature. He's way too tall. Okay, you're saying because I'm a woman, I can't be Jason? Uh, no, you can't be Michael because that's who that is. It's fucked up, man. It's really fucked up. You can't be... I mean, you seem why, why are you turning everything into a gendered issue? I don't know. It just sounds like sexism. This doesn't have to be a sexism issue. This is Freddy a... and Jason and I hate all those this. people. Chucky. Ah, Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers. I guess this is where they got embarrassed that they made so many and took the numbers out of the titles, a la AVGN. Curse was directed by Joe Chappelle, ruiner of Hellraiser 4, and written by the same moron who wrote The Haunting of Sharon Tate, starring Hilary Duff. Good to know we're getting the mark of quality. This movie was supposedly so bad that I was warned against watching it for years. So is it as bad as its reputation? I mean, yeah, but is it the worst Halloween film? No? It's complicated. Let me be clear. I definitely didn't like it. Right away, we're given awful editing and a shitty rock score that I can't believe Alan Howarth composed. And they replaced Danielle Harris as Jamie, even though she went to great lengths to be included. The studio wanted an older actress so they could work longer hours among... <coughs> other things. But Harris, who is only 17, still fought hard to return. The producers suggested that she become emancipated, and she did, which cost her a couple thousand dollars, only to be told that she was only going to get a fraction of what she spent to get emancipated in the first place. Danielle Harris explains, I'll never forget the woman on the other line said to me, your character is a scale character. You die in the first act. We're not giving you any more money. The whole situation is kind of fucked up, especially knowing that this was the first Halloween film to be overseen by the Weinsteins and their notorious behavior. Poor Jamie, who never caught a break, is unceremoniously killed off by Michael after she hides her newborn baby. The script is also really Weinsteiny and rapey, though I'm not sure how much they had to do with it. It's heavily insinuated that Michael impregnated Jamie between Halloween 5 and Curse, meaning, yeah, 
There's underaged incest now. Eat your heart out, remake Freddy. And Michael needs to kill Jamie and her newborn baby because this whole time, he's been in a Halloween cult that worships the thorn rune or constellation or god or something. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. Remember in Halloween 5, there was that man in black? So nobody, not even the director of Halloween 5, knew what the man in black was about when making the movie. So these film makers were forced to explain it here. This incredibly minor character in the first film, Dr. Wynn, is part of the evil cult of Thorn, who all look like characters straight out of Manos the Hands of Fate. And he's secretly been controlling Michael since the first film. So when Loomis said, Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. We now know the culprit. What is this, Rogue One, a Halloween story? <laughs> Michael, I guess, has been cursed to kill every member of his family to appease this druid curse, starting with his older sister Judith? In the alternate producer's cut, they say that the thorn constellation Michael kills under only appears sporadically, and the dates given are 1963, 1978, 1988, 1989, and 1995. Huh, that's lame. And if you think that sucks, don't worry. The characters all suck too. We have Tommy Doyle, a grown-up version of the kid from the first one, played by Paul Rudd in his first theatrical role. Well, technically. Because this movie underwent massive reshoots, Clueless came out first, but he was cast in Halloween 6 first, baby. And boy is he bad in this. I was only eight years old when I saw him. But I was one of the lucky ones. I don't know what he's doing. He's kind of monotone, kind of doing a Loomis impression. He'll come home to kill again. But this time I'll be ready. But he comes off really creepy and pervy. Oh, and Loomis is back, played by a very tired looking Donald Pleasance. And seeing him in this just makes me sad. He passed away before the reshoots could occur, so he's not in the theatrical cut very much. And he's sorely missed. He remained loyal to the franchise until the very end. In the first movie, the Strode family were realtors, which wasn't super important to the plot. But because we have to milk everything now, we're reintroduced to the Strodes who now live in the Myers house because John Strode's brother couldn't get it sold. Can you imagine if that's how it worked? I'm sorry, John, but you didn't sell this property. So, as punishment, you and your family are going to have to live in it. Aw oh, man, but I already have so many houses. I'm sorry, but them's the rules. The rules of real estate. Also, John Strode is a complete asshole. Before you came around, everything was going fine. So you landed on our doorstep, you and that little bastard of yours. I see only one bastard in this house. <laughs> you ever talk to me like that again, and so help me God. I usually hate unlikable characters that are so irredeemable, you're excited to see them die. But this guy... <laughs> Whoa, and we get a head explosion? It's really cathartic. It might be the first kill since Halloween 3 that I actually liked. Though, in the supposedly better version, there's no head explosion. So, pick your poison, I guess. What am I saying? I'm not gonna watch either version of this movie after this. There's also Kara Strode and her son Danny, who hears voices from the man in black telling him to kill, insinuating he's going to become the next Michael. And this plot thread doesn't go anywhere. Though it leads to another scene I think they ruined in the producer's cut, where he pulls a knife on his grandpa after he hits Danny's mom. In the producer's cut, he's egged on by the man in black. In the theatrical cut, it sort of feels like he's doing it to protect his mom which I like better. He's been having nightmares. <laughs> I think it's cool. In any case, Paul Rudd finds Jamie's abandoned baby, meets up with Loomis, then creepily enters Kara's home by way of Danny's bedroom. After inviting them to Paul Rudd's place for safety and explaining the Cult of Thorn nonsense, it's revealed that the woman that Paul Rudd is living with is in cahoots with the cult and Dr. Wynn, kidnapping Kara and Danny, and it's up to Paul Rudd and Loomis to get them back before Michael can kill them. And if it feels like Michael's been taking a backseat this time around, that's because he is. He does periodically show up to kill a few people, but for the most part, he's relegated to an over-glorified henchman. 
So instead of him being a motiveless embodiment of the boogeyman, he's just a pawn to a cult. If that doesn't ruin Michael, I don't know what does. His mask does look admittedly better in this film, though it looks like it was molded out of clay. I don't know. He kind of looks like Ronald McDonald to me. The climax differs by which version you watch, so I'll start with the theatrical cut. Paul Rudd and Dr. Loomis track Kara and Danny to the sanitarium, where they're being held by the cult and Dr. Wynn. Paul Rudd manages to sneak in and save them, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what happens next. Seriously, this was so confusing and epilepsy-inducing, I had no idea what was going on. I actually had to rewind after the movie was over because I had no idea what happened to Dr. Wynn or why Michael abruptly turned on the cult. But that didn't help me either. So I turned to the Wikipedia synopsis, which reads, Michael suddenly appears and turns against Wynn and the doctors, killing them all. That didn't help at all. Paul Rudd then beats Michael to a pulp with a pipe, and Michael bleeds green? Was this an MPAA decision? You can have incest and rape, but God forbid the blood be red. Loomis suddenly reappears, having disappeared for most of the climax, saying he has some business to attend to here before cutting to Michael's mask on the ground and hearing Loomis's disembodied scream, followed by a title dedicated to Donald Pleasance's memory. What a joke. It should also be noted that I checked out the producer's cut, which I mentioned before, which is supposedly better? It replaces Paul Rudd's opening narration with Donald Pleasance, and even though the contents are the same, it makes more sense for it to be Loomis. Loomis is overall in the producer's cut more, even explaining why he no longer wears the burn makeup. I had uh, surgery, plastic surgery, uh, skin grafts. It cost a fortune, but... At least I don't frighten people anymore. It has somewhat of an extended prologue cutting back to the aftermath of Halloween 5, tying the two films together more. The fanbase regards Halloween 4, 5, and Curse as the Thorn Trilogy. But the trilogy is looser than my asshole after a week-long binge at Taco Bell. The music is different, basically just using the John Carpenter score over the stupid rock one. Jamie also doesn't die right away here. After escaping and heading to the barn, like the theatrical cut, Michael wounds her, but doesn't kill her. She just later gets shot in the hospital, though, so it's not the greatest send-off to one of the only good characters in the Thorn trilogy. Basically, the biggest difference is the third act. Instead of being beaten to a pulp, Paul Rudd explains that the Dark Thorn rune could be cancelled out by light runes he just so happens to have in his satchel. Paul Rudd just spills them out on the floor, and Michael just stands there like a little bitch. Yeah, you heard that right. In the producer's cut, Michael Myers is defeated by magic rocks. Amazing. After they all escape, Michael somehow switches clothes with Dr. Wynn and slinks off into the night. And the evil thorn curse is then passed on to Loomis, who delivers the scream that they used in the theatrical cut. <laughs> I mean, I guess the producer's cut is more streamlined, but is it better? Not really. I liked it about the same as I liked the theatrical cut, which was not really at all. One of my biggest problems with the theatrical cut is the editing. But in the producer's cut, what they made up for in the editing, they dropped the ball on the kills. Which, yes, I know, it's not the most important thing, but in a horror movie with nothing else going for it, at least give me some fucking kills. This might be more controversial than my love for three, but I don't think Curse is as bad as five. It's still bottom tier, but not quite last on my list. Only 10 years after Halloween 4, the franchise was rebooted yet again with 1998's Halloween H2O, 20 years later, which ignores the events of 3 through Curse. Okay, let's talk about the title. Why is it called H2O? I get that it's 20 years later, given the subtitle, but the movie has nothing to do with water. I originally thought this was a Fant Four Stick situation, where people just call it H2O, but it's actually pronounced H20. But I looked up interviews and TV spots, and no, it's Halloween. 
H2O. Rated R. The 90s were weird, man. Anyway, after the critical failure of Curse of Michael Myers, several ideas floated around about how to continue the series, like a direct-to-video sequel akin to the later Hellraiser sequels. Kevin Williamson, the writer of Scream, pitched the idea of bringing Laurie Strode back, initially in continuity with the previous films, before morphing into what eventually became H2O. Jamie Lee Curtis agreed to come back, under two stipulations. The first was they had to kill off Michael Myers, which we all know they didn't follow up on, and the second was to try to bring back as much of the original crew as possible, including John Carpenter. But the Weinsteins denied Carpenter's request for $10 million, citing he was still owed money from the original film. Instead, he was replaced by... Oh no, not him! Thank you, sir. Stop it! What's happening, brother? Stop it! Stop it. What are you looking at? Stop it! Yup, it's the director of Soul Man himself, Steve Miner. Jokes aside, I was dreading this one. Not just because of Soul Man, but because of the Friday the 13th sequels he directed, as well as his awful remake of George Romero's Day of the Dead. But I'll put my biases aside, and as long as there's no blackface, I'll give it a fair shake. The movie begins with a cold open, with Nurse Marion from the original 2. It's explained that after the explosion at the end of Halloween 2, still no explanation of how they both survived, she became Loomis's personal live-in nurse, and Loomis never truly believed that Michael was dead. And after murdering a young Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Michael returns to kill Marion, and leaves with Loomis's secret notes. Michael Myers. Yeah, right. Okay, I like a classy opening credit sequence. We see Loomis's Charlie Kelly-esque wall as we hear Loomis's speech from the original film, though for some reason it's performed by voice actor Tom Kane, so he sounds more like Professor Utonium from the Powerpuff Girls. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes. Devil's the film's main plot revolves around Laurie Strode, who faked her death and is now serving as a headmistress named Carrie Tate in a prep school in Northern California. Things seem to be going pretty well for her. That is, until Halloween rolls around. She becomes increasingly paranoid, turning to her vices and becoming overprotective of her son John, played by Josh Hartnett. Since they never found Michael's body, which in reality they wouldn't because he was burned to a crisp, Laurie is haunted by the idea that he could return at any moment to finish what he started 20 years earlier. Something that really bothered me about this movie is the score. The Halloween themes sound way too whimsical, like they were composed by Danny Elfman or John Williams or something. And most of the music isn't even John Ottman's score. A lot of it was actually taken from Scream. Open up, it's me! Also, Michael's mask. Seriously, it shouldn't be this hard to get the mask right. It has to be one of the easiest props to make. But here, there's four different masks. And yes, I'm counting the CGI abomination. And none of them look good. I mean, look at that. He looks like an alien. And if you're expecting me to rip into this even more, you're gonna be disappointed because y'all are gonna hate me. I kinda liked this film. It's not a masterpiece by any means, but a lot more works here than what doesn't. Even though Dean Cundy didn't come back, he had moved on to doing Jurassic Park and nothing but trouble at this point. Somebody behind the scenes was smart enough to restore the series' 235 aspect ratio. And the cast is pretty solid too. Like the previously mentioned Jamie Lee Curtis, we also have a young Michelle Williams as John's girlfriend Molly. And LL Cool J? What the hell? Actually, he's not half bad. He plays somewhat of a comic relief security guard, but he's not played over the top. I was actually excited when he survived this. We also have a fun cameo by Curtis's real-life mother, Janet Lee, playing Laurie's secretary at Hillcrest Academy. And her big scene is full of, eh, moments. It's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare. Eh? If I could be maternal for a moment. Eh? Eh? 
It's also refreshing that the characters in this aren't unrealistically stupid. There's an awesome chase scene with John and Molly, where they're both grappled by Michael individually. But, even though they're understandably scared, they do fight back and manage to escape, bar some cuts and bruises. It all culminates with Lori saving them, slamming the door, and looking her brother in the eye for the first time in 20 years. And it's so well executed. I was literally on the edge of my seat. The gore effects are also cool, with a leg wound that gives Freddy Got Finger to run for its money. After Lori gets the kids to safety, she decides to face her demons and go mano a mano with Michael, ending her trauma once and for all. She gets the upper hand and incapacitates him, again throwing down the knife. And then you think the movie's coming to a close, and that the sequel bait is right around the corner. But no! After loading Michael's body into an ambulance, Lori steals the vehicle, waits for Michael to wake up, throws him through the windshield, runs him over, throws him off a hill, and pins him between the ambulance and a tree. Michael, still somehow alive, tries to reach out for Lori, who doesn't take his shit, so she cuts his head clean off. Then, the movie ends. I can't believe I'm saying this, but... I really liked that. Not all of it works. It's very 90s, and like I said, the music isn't great, and they never do explain how Michael survived, or how he still has eyes after Lori shot them out in Halloween 2. But whatever. It got us to this fun little movie, so I can suspend my disbelief. Hey, at least this film didn't lie about being shot in California. So you got one from me, Steve Miner. I still don't forgive you for Soul Man, but you did the impossible and made a halfway decent Halloween movie. I'm ranking this one between Halloween 3 and Halloween 2. If you can get past the stupid brother-sister twist from Halloween 2, this would make a satisfying conclusion to the franchise. But of course, money talks, so a satisfying conclusion was not on the horizon. Halloween Resurrection was the first Halloween movie I was aware of in theaters. I probably vaguely knew what the series was, or at least knew of Michael Myers, but I was only 10 in 2002, and I didn't have much interest at the time. Actually, I do remember my friends distinctly wanting to see it, and even getting their mom to agree to get us in. I was too scared, but I didn't want it to come off like I was scared, so I came up with some bullshit that I still remember to this day. I said, well, it's a sequel. So they're gonna say, hey, I know how we can beat him, we'll do it the same way we did in the last movie. And then a black screen with white text would pop up and say, you don't need to see this scene because you already saw it in the last movie. And the stupidest thing? is that it worked. And we ended up watching Reign of Fire or Signs instead, I don't remember. I tried to use the same excuse again when the same friends wanted to see the second Tomb Raider movie a year later, but only because I wasn't interested. Suffice it to say, it didn't work that time. So why am I talking about childhood excuses and not Halloween Resurrection? Because what do you want me to say about Halloween Resurrection? It's awful. It's kind of awful in a funny way though, but mostly in a boring way. That's becoming a pattern with these shitty sequels. They're all boring. Remember how I said they didn't follow up on Jamie Lee Curtis's plea to kill off Michael Myers? Well, here was the compromise. Producer Mustafa Akkad told the production that they weren't allowed to kill off Michael Myers, which led to Jamie Lee Curtis almost walking off H2O. Writer Kevin Williamson came up with this convoluted plan to have Michael crush a paramedic's throat and swap costumes, kind of like what Michael did in the producer's cut of Curse. So when Laurie cuts off Michael's head at the end of H2O, she's actually killing an innocent man. Curtis agreed to this, only if the paramedic scene would not be included in the final cut, but instead used in the inevitable sequel. This is why Michael wakes up and frantically checks his mask before his beheading. Knowing this now, it kind of takes away from my enjoyability of H2O. Tell me about her. She decapitated a man. <laughs> oh my god, she killed the wrong person. Stop it! Stop it! Father of three. Stop it! I didn't the paramedics say something? His larynx had been crushed. Stop it! So, yeah. Lori's in the psych ward now. Before Michael shows up, a lame chase ensues on the roof of the sanitarium. He stabs her in the back and throws her off the roof. And that's it. Lori Strode is dead. No mention of what happened to John or any of the other characters from the previous movie. Not only can I not believe that Jamie Lee Curtis agreed to this, it was probably a contractual thing, but I can't believe how scummy the marketing is. They advertised her front and center, but she's killed off in the opening 
scene. It's a piss poor way to end the story of Laurie Strode, and an abysmal sequel to one of the only enjoyable films in the series. But there's been so many bad entries, it's hard for me to even be mad. Also, why does she kiss her brother on the mouth? The rest of the movie I sort of have to put into context. Not that it's complicated by any stretch of the imagination, but it's very much a product of its time. The year was 2002. Everyone was obsessed with the wonders of the somewhat early days of the internet and live streaming, even though I don't think we called it that yet. It was also after the 1999 smash hit The Blair Witch Project, which, like the original Halloween, became one of the most successful independent films of all time. And all of it was done with a camcorder, so the found footage genre became incredibly popular. But it was a risk that Halloween Resurrection wasn't fully willing to take. The film was partially shot with standard 30 5mm cameras, which looks fine, it looks like a movie, but half of the film was shot POV style with crappy webcams. This probably didn't look great in 2002, but now, in 4K, this looks not just appalling, but it's distracting. Quality of the film aside, it is an intriguing premise. Live streamers documenting their stay in the Myers house and having an audience participate? That's not much different from what a lot of modern YouTubers do. The problem is the execution, no pun intended. Michael, somehow, returns to Haddonfield after he kills Lori in California. Unlike H2O, where we see him stealing cars and making his way there, we don't see how he returns to the Midwest. His mask is also marginally better here, but it looks like he caked makeup all over it and is ready for his close-up. He also looks too angry again, though it's not as horrendous as the Halloween 5 mask, it's definitely better than that. Also, Michael has this goofy walk that reminds me of Charlie Chaplin, which I hope to God wasn't intentional. Michael's played here by stuntman Brad Laurie, and the only reason I bring this up is because he was a stuntman in one of the greatest pieces of performance art ever, Freddy Got Fingered. <laughs> None of the characters are particularly likable, save Busta Rhymes, who's god awful in this, and I enjoyed every second he was on screen. Knocking on my door this late, whoever this is is distracting me from seeing Wa Chun Li whoop some ass. Sam? Ooh. He's racist, sexist, and an opportunist, and only knows how to make two faces throughout the entire film. I don't know if his casting was the result of fellow rapper LL Cool J being a surprisingly fun part of the last movie, but if that's the case, it didn't pay off at all. We were getting caught up in kind of the stunt casting and sort of so we had LL Cool J in the last one, let's bring Buster Rhymes. <laughs> He and Tyra Banks, of all people, played the heads of Dangertainment, an online-based media company running the reality show at the Myers house. This is also somewhat ahead of its time. It kind of reminds me of something like Ghost Adventures or an MCN. There's also this scene that goes on for way too long where Busta Rhymes, who's faking a lot of the reality show, shows up in a Michael Myers costume and just berates the real Michael Myers when he shows up. You need to get the hell out of here! Go on, scoop! Skedaddle, get the fuck out of Dodge! And the funny thing is that Michael actually listens to him. If the other characters aren't memorable, then they're at least problematic. And I'm not even one of those people that complains about that kind of shit. So that's how you know it's bad. Almost every character sounds like mouthpieces for the Weinsteins. Which, again, I'm not entirely sure how involved they were. But if you know anything about the Weinsteins, they were pretty intrusive. Like, there's the final girl, Sarah, who's in college and in an online relationship with Deckard, a high school student. Also, Deckard's friend is dressed like Samuel L. Jackson's character Jules from Pulp Fiction at a Halloween party, and that rides a similar line of pushing it. And I can't even blame that on H2O's director Steve Miner, as this film was directed by Rick Rosenthal, who directed Halloween 2. See, I told you you'd hear that name again. And boy, do these writers not know how to write young people. Screwing a music major would be tantamount to lesbianism. One flash and you could light up a thousand computer screens. Launch your whole career. And if the filmmakers don't understand how young people talk, then they definitely don't understand internet lingo. She's never even seen you. And Yahoo chat rooms do not count. Did you know in the old days, knights used to spend their entire lives courting ladies that they would never even touch? Yeah, that's before internet porn, man. You've been pussy whipped. 
What's worse, you've been cyber whipped. The kills are nothing to write home about, but there's one that's worth mentioning when Michael bursts out of a mirror that literally makes no sense. How the hell did he do that? And how does nobody hear this guy screaming? I know it's a big house, but it's not that big. The climax is certainly meme worthy. Earlier in the movie, Buster Rhymes has a martial arts showdown, which is a payoff to the racism, I guess, but it doesn't end well for him. But after being stabbed twice, he somehow survives to have one final confrontation with Michael. Trick or treat. Motherfucker. He then electrocutes Michael, sending him to burn in the fire, as if that stopped him before. Also, Michael audibly makes this weird ghostly sound when being shocked by Busta Rhymes. <laughs> Just thought I should mention that. He also gives this hackneyed speech at the end about how he shouldn't glorify violence and killers like Michael Myers. Michael Myers is not a soundbite, a spinoff, a tie-in, some kind of celebrity scandal. We're done dancing for these cameras. And of course, there's a sequel tease of Michael waking up Jason style in a morgue before cutting to credits. Now, I completely understand why this is on the bottom of pretty much everyone's list. It's bad, and it feels like a script to an unrelated movie that they just threw Michael Myers into. But I'm sorry, I didn't hate it as much as Halloween 5. And everyone, feel free to disagree with me. I'd actually love to see how y'all would rank these in the comments. I'm genuinely curious. One final anecdote about this movie is this is one of the only Halloween sequels that John Carpenter actually watched. When promoting the 2018 reboot, Carpenter recalled, I watched the one in that house with all the cameras. Oh my god. God, oh Lord God. And then the guy gives the speech at the end about violence? What the hell? Oh my Lord, I couldn't believe. Neither can I, John. Neither can I. Now, I'm usually against remakes. There are exceptions, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Fly, or even John Carpenter's own The Thing. But for the most part, I just prefer original ideas. Looking at you, Disney. However, after watching eight of these mostly not very good movies, from a business standpoint, I get it. Where the hell do you go after Resurrection? Remake. All right, story time. Rob Zombie's Halloween was my first Halloween movie. And when it came out in 2007, little 15 year old me loved it. My first concert was Ozfest 1999 in Somerset, Wisconsin, I believe, when I was seven years old. Don't question my stupid dad's parenting. This is one of the only decent memories I have of him. Maybe I'll go into more detail about it one day, but to make a long story short, the reason I was so excited to go to this concert is because my favorite album at the time was Rob Zombie's Hellbilly Deluxe. So seeing him live at Ozfest was so fucking rad. Then around 2004, there was this alt girl that I had a really big crush on. And one night she wanted to show me Rob Zombie's first film, House of a Thousand Corpses. And you know what? I pretended to like it because you know how teenage boys are. But it was cool to see this horror rocker who was clearly influenced by film getting into film himself. So how was revisiting my childhood favorite Halloween film? <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> Well, maybe not that horrible, but still pretty bad. For my rewatch of Rob Zombie's Halloween, I enlisted the help of Jeremy and Tabor, and we filmed our experience, so I'll pepper in our little asides throughout this film's discussion. I just thought I'd shake things up a bit. Our perspectives being me, who hates the movie but grew up with it, Tabor, who's a huge horror fan, and Jeremy, who I believe this movie was scientifically designed not to appeal to him, and Jeremy, in his drunken stupor, decided to face his mic away from him. So yeah, this should be fun. Firstly, almost every character is just yelling and screaming at each other, and the whole sense of the film just feels so dirty. I get that this is Rob Zombie's style, but his aesthetic and sensibilities lend themselves more to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre more so than Halloween. Bitch, I will crawl over there and I will skull fuck this shit out of you! We were 45 seconds in this film. <laughs> Not only does Michael get ridiculed by his, I think, stepfather, and mocked by this film's version of Judith, but he's relentlessly bullied at school by Junie Cortez from Spy Kids. Because Michael's mom is a stripper? The idea of developing a young Michael Myers this way, and seeing that he comes from a broken home, already makes him infinitely less interesting. Because they introduced humanity to him, and establishes motive as 
as to why he feels the way he does. And that's the key word here, feels. He's supposed to be the embodiment of pure evil, motiveless in his actions. I know full well what Rob Zombie is going for. It's a whole new perspective on the character, but it's not for me. And it's not what I look for in a Halloween movie. Fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck me. Come on over here. Fuck me. Because of Michael's disturbing behavior, the school calls upon this universe's version of Dr. Loomis, played by Malcolm McDowell, who's way more hip and fresh, man. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> That's Dr. Loomis? <laughs> Damn, Dr. Loomis is cool now. <laughs> <laughs> up to this point, Michael has been seen torturing animals to death. But after being bullied by Juni Cortez, he follows him into Griffith Park to beat him to death with a tree branch. And I'm not gonna lie, this scene disturbed the shit out of me when I was younger. Even now, it's probably one of the most brutal kills in the entire franchise, if not the most visceral. I still don't like the motive behind it, but it's unnerving to see a literal child plead for his life every second as he's being killed. Wait, he's still asleep? <laughs> well, he's a drunk. I mean... Your buddies never duct tape you, dude. <laughs> Michael goes on to kill his stepfather, his sister's boyfriend, then finally, Judith, catching us up to the first three minutes of the original film. You know, all this was a minute in the first movie. Oh yeah, we're yeah. not even past the opening scene of the first movie. Yeah. See, Michael Myers, he played too many video games. Yeah. yeah uh, this is the result of Doom. Well, at this point, it'd be like... Pong. Pong. <laughs> they got a Magnavox Odyssey. <laughs> it just fucked him up. One strange thing that they change is Michael gets his iconic mask from Judith's boyfriend, who just has it, I guess. Come on, babe. I want to do it with the mask on. It begs the question of what the mask is even supposed to be. In the original film, we only ever see adult Michael wearing it, so we never really question what it is. But by even giving the mask a backstory, even more questions arise. He just looks so sad. Silly. This is me when I'm trying to get to the 7-Eleven bathroom and I've already shit my pants. <laughs> Michael is then taken, treated, and evaluated by Dr. Loomis at Smith's Grove, who tries to convince the audience that this creepy kid is normal and unassuming. To the untrained eye, there's nothing visually abnormal. He looks like a creep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is very visually abnormal. <laughs> Michael starts retreating further into himself, kinda making him more like the original character. Though he seems to enjoy making masks and definitely enjoys killing way too much. Yep, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> his mother can no longer live with the guilt of having Michael as her son, leaving baby Lori an orphan. We then jump ahead to Michael as an adult, and here lies another problem that I have with this movie. Michael Myers is way too fucking big. Michael is played here by 6'9 wrestler Tyler Mayne, the only actor to play Michael twice consecutively until the reboot. And I have nothing against Tyler Mayne. He actually looks like he's having a ton of fun here. He's just not what I want in a Michael Myers. Do you think Tyler Mayne is just incredibly large in that chair? Or do you think they wanted to accentuate how big he was and they gave him like a smaller chair? I think there's some forced perspective going on there. Michael's escape from the sanitarium depends on which version you watch. I didn't watch both cuts of the film like I did with Curse, mostly because I didn't have the energy to basically watch the same film twice. But also, the theatrical cut is strangely hard to find here in the States. In any case, in the theatrical cut, he just kind of overpowers the guards. It's simple, but it's a thousand times better than what they did in the director's cut. These two backwater deep south hick guards. Which, wait, isn't this supposed to be the Midwest? Hi there, sweetie. Hi. Huh? Well, we're, we're just here to look. Oh, yeah, they're supposed to be in the Illinois, Illinois, right? Yeah. Why are they all talking like they're from the deep <laughs> south? <laughs> That's just how we talk around here on Illinois. Whatever. These two idiots come to work after hours to sexually assault a female inmate. What's worse is that the rape feels gratuitous and sexualized, which is very Weinstein of the movie. Even more stupid is that they think it's a great idea to do all of this in Michael's room. Predictably, Michael murders the guards, though only after they fuck with his masks. I'm getting off this subject now because I hate it, but I'll tell you that we're 50 minutes into this film and we're only caught up to the opening scene of the original movie. So isn't that a cool way that he escaped? I don't know what the point of the rape scene was. You know, gross. So it's edgy. He's trying to be edgy. Yeah. yeah. It, it felt like they were sexualizing it a little bit. Yeah. Sexualizing it. 
the rape of an innocent woman. Like Halloween 4, we have to see every step of how Michael acquires his iconic outfit. I'm getting glad he had time to bury the mask underneath the floorboards <laughs> and nail it shut. Yeah, what the fuck? When did he get a chance to do that? See, remember... And what? the knife's down there too, yeah. What? <laughs> Luckily, this is when we're introduced to the best character in the film, Joe Grizzly, played by Dawn of the Dead's Ken Forey. Naughty girl, naughty, naughty girl. Hey, buddy, just give you a heads up. I got a Taco Deluxe Supreme talking back at me, so I'm gonna be a while. I got something for you. Let me introduce myself. I'm Joe Grizzly, bitch. I'm gonna cut that mask right off your face. You Imagine if Joe Grizzly won. I want to. I want to see the <laughs> Joe, Joe Grizzly. This is the matchup we've all been waiting for. <laughs> they should have called this movie Michael Myers versus Joe Grizzly. <laughs> so I do want to. I do want a Joe Grizzly prequel. Okay? Yeah. I see what that guy's all about. Joe Grizzly. On that subject, the side character casting is very hit or miss. We have Forey, Brad Dorif as Sheriff Brackett, and D. Wallace as Mrs. Strode, who are all great. Even Danielle Harris, who previously portrayed Jamie in Halloween's 4 and 5, is back as Laurie's best friend Annie. But then we have incredibly distracting cameos from Sid Haig, Clint Howard, and most egregiously, Rob Zombie's wife, Sherry Moon Zombie. Don't you give me that look! Hmm, this is where I was buried. Hmm. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Not counting the baby, Laurie Strode doesn't appear until halfway through the movie. And no disrespect to Scout Taylor Compton, but she's no Jamie Lee Curtis. Though most of that is chalked up to the script. The writing is just so amateur and terrible. You two make me sick. I've never heard um, a real person say that line ever. You, you make me sick. It, me sick. it is very it's... basic writing. It must be great living in denial. I must try it sometime. Look. That's, <laughs> That's bad. You're totally a slut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay, man? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was good. And to make matters worse, the movie just decides to speed run the original film from this point on, cutting out the character development and replacing it with gore and, more importantly, boobs. Hell, even Lori is overly sexualized. What the fuck is it? Okay. That's Lori Strode. You know. It's in character. <laughs> She's the one who wants to fuck real bad. They're finding any excuse to yeah. show me if you got them. That's yeah. what that was the slogan on set, I guess. I don't know if you noticed, but they, they skipped most of the character development scenes and just skipped right to... Yes. Lori babysitting. That's yeah. fine. I've already seen Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> In this film's quest to recreate the original John Carpenter classic, by nature of Rob Zombie's changes, they don't add up. Like, if this is supposed to be a grittier, more realistic take on the story, why still include the knife pinning on the wall gag? I appreciate that they gave a reason as to why Michael comes back after that kill as a ghost, unlike the original where he did it for no reason, but this Linda should know that this nine foot tall monster isn't Bob. She thinks it's her boyfriend, not realizing that this guy nine is tall. nine feet tall. And it just occurred to me, in both the original and the remake, these characters' names are Bob and Linda. Weird. Wouldn't it be cool if like, she, she started pooping? I mean, when you die, you shit yourself. Yeah. So. Sure. I, you would think that that's what that shot is for. Anyway, Michael murders his way through the rest of the movie, eventually making his way to Lori. However, unlike the original, even though Annie is horribly maimed by Michael, she somehow survives the bloodbath. She was a trooper though, man. She kept those tits out for a while. Holy <laughs> shit. And Michael doesn't initially plan to kill Lori, but instead kidnaps her and attempts to convey that he's her brother. Like John Carpenter, she rejects this notion, and Michael decides, Oh, who am I kidding? I'm gonna kill you anyway. Loomis returns in the nick of time to rescue Lori. Is that the boogeyman? Okay. <laughs> but this was a false ending. And did I mention that this movie is two hours long? That's way too long for a slasher movie. After another exhausting five minutes of mayhem, Lori getting beat up pretty bad, and Loomis getting his eyes gouged out, we finally get the balcony shot. But instead of of the original's ambiguous ending, we get Laurie shooting Michael in the fucking face. So, great or a masterpiece? 
Now, I don't think Rob Zombie is a bad filmmaker necessarily, and yes, I know he's made nothing but crap like this year's The Munsters, but clearly he's going for a grindhouse aesthetic, which for what he was going for, he actually captures it quite well. The problem is, I personally don't think this works as a Halloween movie. When asked about what he thought of Zombie's take, John Carpenter claimed that Zombie lied about him being cold in regards to the remake, but Counter claims that he was, in fact, supportive of it. But upon seeing it, Carpenter remarked, I thought that he took away the mystique of the, of the story by explaining too much about the guy. I don't care about that. It's supposed to be a force of nature. He's supposed to be almost supernatural. And he was too big. Both Zombie and Carpenter would later bury the kitchen knife, as it were. Zombie feeling bad about characterizing Carpenter in that way. Regardless, I'm putting this one above Halloween 4, but under Halloween 2. So I'm gonna be honest, I kind of moved around my rankings a little bit towards the end of filming because I had to live with these movies for, what, four months at this point? And after watching the nearly four and a half hour long documentary making of this film, it's clear that, unlike the other cynical cash grabs in this franchise, Rob Zombie actually cared about what he was making. And for that reason, it's kind of hard to hate. Admittedly, I still see this movie with nostalgia goggles, because I grew up with it, but it does completely miss the point of the original film. I miss Joe Grizzly. Yeah, yeah. he really was the highlight. He knew what he liked. Tacos, taking shits, <laughs> big tits, not getting stabbed. Yeah. <laughs> Even though not critically well received, Rob Zombie's Halloween opened number one at the box office and was the highest grossing Labor Day opening until last year's Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. So, naturally, the studio greenlit a sequel, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Zombie was reluctant to return, stating he was exhausted by the experience. Zombie later explained, I had to deal with that a lot when I made the two Halloween movies. For oh, Weinstein Company. Well, that was weird meddling. It was just like kind of psychotic meddling. Like my phone was ringing all the time when I'm on set working and it'd be like, we think it should be this. I'm like, well, if I did that, then everything we shot doesn't match. <laughs> and it makes no sense. Despite this, after his first Halloween movie was a smash hit, he was encouraged to make his own sequel, not bound by the rules of the franchise, which he did for better or worse mostly worse. Let me start off by saying that his Halloween 2 is a weird movie. It's a bad movie to be sure, but it's fascinating in its badness. Again, I forced Jeremy to watch this one with me, this time with the microphone actually facing him, but Tabor bowed out to go to a Lamb of God concert. I'm having so much fun not watching Halloween 2. Sorry, man. Fucking asshole. That's a different boy. Well, he was in Hancock between this, so that, now he's asking for Hancock money. <laughs> Unlike his first film, where they just speed run the original film in the second half, here, it's flipped. The first 20 minutes are essentially a speed run of the original Halloween 2, before radically veering off into its own story. They're gonna, like, be faced with the challenge of actually making new movie. <laughs> and I, it was surprisingly, that's where this one falls apart. Yeah. Right away, like the previous film, the characters are irredeemably unlikable. There's these paramedics driving Michael's body who talk about finding hot corpses to have their way with, and it's all just gross. I got wood just zip locking her up. Stop! Shut up! Ah! Do you like how the scene is just still going too? Yes! <laughs> I love it. Michael predictably wakes up and takes them out, though, before they can indulge in their reprehensible fantasies. Also, wait, how did Michael survive? Didn't he get shot in the head? Whatever, that's the least of our worries, as we're introduced to this bizarre white horse motif that's sprinkled throughout the movie. All right, he's getting, he's suddenly where he's a sensitive artiste, okay. <laughs> it's almost like Rob Zombie binged Twin Peaks between the making of these two movies and just crammed some of the ideas in there. Also, I hate that Michael talks to his dead mother through a personification of his younger self. The whole giant slasher killing for mother thing was Jason's shtick. Just like how the last movie felt more Texas Chainsaw Massacre than Halloween, this one is definitely going for artsy Friday the 13th. You know, it's times like this I miss Joe Grizzly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want Joe Grizzly to come back as like a cyborg. <laughs> to, to fight Michael Myers. To fight Michael Myers. If I were to ever make a 
Oh, really? That's what it would be. As predicted, Michael makes his way to the hospital and murders a before she was famous Octavia Spencer, angrily grunting while doing so. And that's another thing this movie gets wrong. Michael is way too audible. Oh, I don't like Michael making sound. Yeah. As if it couldn't get any worse, the first 20 minutes were all part of Lori's dream. <laughs> Shut up! Or was it? Well, it was, but some of the elements are confusingly canon to the rest of the movie, like the white horse dead mother crap. Lori is now living with Annie and Sheriff Brackett, and is suffering from PTSD, becoming an alt chick who hangs a poster of Charles Manson on her wall. Hey, Paul Rudd had a picture of Divine, specifically from Pink Flamingos on his fridge, so who am I to judge? Like Jamie and Michael in the Thorn trilogy, Lori and Michael are psychically linked, foreshadowed by not only her dream, but her kiss shirt that that parallels Michael's when he was a child in the first film. What is that? That? That's whatever you think it is, is what that is. I mean, it's very clearly horses. Loomis, having survived his severe injuries and is somehow able to see, has become a bitter sellout. And I'm kinda here for it. Like, he's even, like, walking with swagger. He's like, <laughs> see, like, he's like... What I'm not here for is Hobo Michael and constantly seeing his face. We've seen Homeless Michael in Halloween 5 and later in Halloween Ends, but his aesthetic is still recognizably Michael Myers. Here, he's a giant killer vagabond who continues to kill these Alabama rednecks that are, for some reason, in Illinois. Oh look, he found dinner. Do you think Michael Myers has like favorite dogs to eat? Like favorite breeds? That he thinks tastes but tastes better. Do you think he it like he'll see like a like a German Shepherd and it's like black licorice to him where he's like ugh, ugh, ugh. no I'll pass. Hey, I like black licorice, so maybe <laughs> maybe German Shepherd's my dog of choice. <laughs> Another bothersome quality to the Rob Zombie duology is the characters constantly underestimate and tease Michael. In the other films, he was just a regular sized dude in a mask, so it kind of made sense when they didn't take him seriously. Yes, even in Resurrection. But this Michael is an evil, haggard looking giant, so why do these scrawny motherfuckers always try to pick fights with him and expect to win? All the kills are so telegraphed, and you could see them coming from a mile away. There's nothing remotely memorable about them, even compared to the last movie. Lori has a mental breakdown when she purchases Loomis's new book and discovers that she's Michael Myers' sister, Angel Myers. But wait, how did Loomis publish a book with her photo in it without her consent? You can sue the shit out of this guy! To get her mind off things, her friends take her out to a Halloween party. And wait, how did she not only get a screen accurate magenta from Rocky Horror Picture Show costume so fast, but have the time to get the makeup so spot on? This movie, when it's not looking like an overexposed repo music video is just a hodgepodge of all the shit that Rob Zombie personally likes, with no rhyme or reason to their inclusion. A perfect example is that at the Halloween party, there's a psychobilly band called Captain Klieg and the Night Creatures. Here's the thing. Captain Klieg, known in the States as Night Creatures, is a somewhat obscure Hammer horror film from the 1960s, starring Hammer regular Peter Cushing. It's a fun little movie, but its reference here is a little baffling. And this is not an insult to the average Rob Zombie fan, but I don't know if the average Rob Zombie fan is seeking out Captain Klieg and the Night Creatures. I guess this is less of a criticism and more just a baffling choice of reference. I just want to know what he was thinking. Well, that was a waste of time. Anyway. Lori returns home, only to find that Michael has mortally wounded Annie. And all of a the sudden, they seem to have a very different relationship. Oh my God, baby. baby, what the fuck? No, baby, no, no, we can't go. No, I'm not yet. So, are they lesbians? I don't mind if they are, they can be. Yeah. Just, they just kind of established a very different relationship with them. Like, just now. Yeah. I want to reiterate, I wouldn't care in the slightest if they made Lori and Annie gay. But, you know, maybe establish it, right, Maya? Most of these butch lesbians, they want to be the guy smacking the hot chick around. And a lot of the chicks, they like it. And if they can't find a man to smack them around, well, they found them a girl going to do it real good. Of course, you're going to get chained up one time. They're going to put that devil mask or that piggy mask on. They're going to say, now I'm going to torture you for about six weeks to start begging for your mommy and your daddy. Anyway... <laughs> what 
What a power move, dude. Later, Michael kidnaps Lori, and they both see the apparition of their mother, and Loomis, who feels super disconnected from the rest of the plot, comes once again to the rescue. Loomis is able to distract Michael's focus away from Lori, but this time, Michael actually kills Loomis, but not before breaking the number one rule about Michael Myers. Die! Yup, adult Michael's first on-screen word is... Die. How apt. Michael is then gunned down Halloween 4 style when Lori is led outside by the ghost of her biological mother. The cops, stupidly, gun her down too, killing our three main characters while this silly slow rendition of Love Hurts plays, hearkening back to the sad stripping scene from the previous film. Lori is then seen in a white room in Purgatory or maybe she survived. It's kind of up to interpretation, with her mother walking in with that white horse one last time, ending the film like a shitty mid-2000s music video. Like I said for the last one, I did not watch the theatrical cut, for the same reasons I said before. I don't harbor any nostalgia for this movie, so I could confidently say none of my biases came into play when ranking this one. But I would also like to say that I don't harbor any hate towards Rob Zombie as a person. By all accounts, he seems like a chill dude, and I can separate the film from the filmmaker. I initially had this one ranked a lot lower, but in all fairness, I think I'm gonna bump it above Halloween 4, but under the first Rob Zombie film. It bears repeating that I moved around my ranking a few times after having lived with these movies after months of editing. I don't hate it as much. I, at least I appreciate it more. Whereas Halloween's 4 through Curse were all cynical cash grabs, from everything that I've seen, Rob Zombie really cared about making his movies his way, and I'll take an ambitious, earnest failure over corporate greed any day. I appreciate that it was a big swing. It was definitely a swing and a miss and happened during a sport that doesn't involve swinging, but a big swing nonetheless. Also, I can't believe it took them 10 movies to acknowledge actor Mike Myers in relation to Michael Myers. The Austin Powers Mike Myers? Or is this oh, somebody brought it up. Somebody brought it up. Before we move on, I want to share one final clip of me and Jeremy watching the credits when, let's say a familiar name shows up. Wait, Bill Fagger Blake is in this? <laughs> What's his name? Bill Fagger Blake. <laughs> I, no, it's not. <laughs> yes, it is. Look. <laughs> Look. That's not how you pronounce it. Oh, Fagger Bake. Okay. That is, dude, ain't. Fadger Bake? Fager Bake? Did you, do you know who that is? Yes. There's He's Patrick in, in SpongeBob. There is no way that's how you pronounce his name. <laughs> Should we find out before this stops recording? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi. I'm Bill Fagerbike. And I'm Tom Kenny. Fagerbike. Fagerbike. Fager, what is it? Fagerbike. Fagerbike? Fagerbike. Fagerbach? Hi, I'm Bill Fagerbike. And I'm Fagerbach. Yeah, like, that's how I would pronounce it if I was him. <laughs> Not the, what you said. <laughs> when it came out and you started laughing, I immediately regretted <laughs> After Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 failed to connect with audiences, the planned Halloween 3D fell through at the Weinstein Company. Which, in retrospect, I'm surprised there wasn't a Halloween 3D, especially in the 80s. The franchise would lay dormant for nearly a decade, and there had been so many changes since then. I mean, there was the whole Weinstein scandal, but let's not get into that. No, I'm talking about a little movie that changed everything. And not for the better. Yeah, The Force Awakens had to come along and ruin everything, didn't it? Since then, there have been so many other movies following its formula. In other words, making the same movie, but marketing it as a sequel. And in no genre is it any more prevalent than in horror, with the recent Candyman and even this year's Texas Chainsaw Massacre on Netflix. And with the recent resurgence and interest in horror, thanks to A24 and Blumhouse, we got Halloween 2018, courtesy of the latter. And right away here, we have a problem. Like Candyman, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and even the new Scream, they just called it Halloween. 
making it the third film in the franchise just called Halloween. Because of this, fans refer to this entry as Halloween 2018, and the previous films of the same name as either John Carpenter's or Rob Zombie's. Halloween 2018 was directed by David Gordon Green, but why it's not referred to as David Gordon Green's Halloween is probably because it's a direct sequel to the original 1978 film, ignoring every other film in any canon. He was also an odd choice of director, to say the least. Mostly known for doing stoner comedies like Your Highness or Pineapple Express, starring this film's co-writer Danny McBride. Weird choices all around. Halloween 2018 was the first Halloween film I saw in theaters, and I liked it a lot. But in the years since, and rewatching it for this, after seeing the previous 10, my opinion has diminished a little bit. It's a great movie on a technical level, except for some recreations that feel half-assed. But overall, it's basically just a remake of the first one, bar some homages I'll get into later. They did manage to bring back Jamie Lee Curtis for the first time since Resurrection, but this time, actually looking like she wants to be there. And she also served as producer alongside John Carpenter. And not only that, John Carpenter returned for the first time since Halloween 3, also providing the score with his two sons. And I'll just say this right now, the music is the best part of the movie. The film has probably my favorite piece written by John Carpenter ever, The Shape Hunts Allison. Because this film knocks out everything but the original, the film opens with Michael having been incarcerated for 40 years, somehow arrested after his 1978 rampage, and returned to Smith's Grove. Loomis's successor, Dr. Sartain, allows two true crime podcasters, one of whom looks like a knockoff Kenneth Branagh, to try to convince Michael to speak with them, even going so far as to offer his original mask, but to no avail. We then cut to opening credits, homaging the original film, even bringing the pumpkin back, inflating back to life, signifying the franchise's return to basics after all these years. In the years since the original, Lori has become a survivalist recluse, waiting for the day she believes will come where Michael returns to finish her off. It's played a bit too over the top for me, and we've already seen a similar yet more realistic take on Lori in H2O. They basically turned her into Sarah Connor from Terminator 2, but I get it, they're trying to do the whole prey becomes the predator thing, and for the most part, it works. It's not wholly original, but it's fine. We're then introduced to Lori's estranged family, her granddaughter Allison, her daughter Karen, played by Judy Greer, and not to be confused with Jamie or John from different timelines, and her stepson Ray, played by Cotton Hill himself, Thanks, wife. Toby Huss. I got peanut butter on my penis. Even though Karen is trying to keep her family at arm's length with Lori, Allison does try to maintain a relationship with her grandmother, even when she creepily stares at her like her brother from another continuity. Wasn't it her brother? Who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. I mean, what, a couple people getting killed by one guy with a knife is not that big of a deal. Remember that line. It's not important here, but it will be when we get to Halloween Kills. I saw him. The shape. Stop. We get the familiar prisoner escape sequence and Michael stealing a car thing from the original, but this brings me to a gripe that I have with this trilogy, specifically with the first two. David Gordon Green and Danny McBride write these little asides with these one-off characters that are humorous on paper, but are out of place, and only serve to screech the movie to a halt so Michael can kill them. Right now, dancing is my thing, you know, and it really hits me in the heart. Bon Me is essentially just the Vietnamese version of... A French baguette. Chocolatey homemade brownie, I made that myself. That's like what a five-year-old would eat if they could make their own lunch. <sighs> I know that they're trying to get you to like them, so it's sad when you see them killed, but giving them a little thing over the course of two minutes doesn't establish enough of a relationship with the audience for us to care. We do get the Michael putting his outfit together scene like Halloween 4 and the Rob Zombie remake with a little bit of H2O thrown in there but it's kinda neat seeing him out of focus in the background while he's doing it. Though, I maintain Michael is never this brutal if we're only going off the original film. Is that the Cinema Sin sound effect? After killing the two podcasters, he retrieves his iconic mask, completing his ensemble. 
Now, this isn't the first time we've seen an aged Michael Myers mask. We saw that in the Rob Zombie movies. But it's cool that this one was painstakingly recreated from the original mask, even if he does look a little like Winnie the Pooh. As the movie goes on, you get the idea that they're not just making a sequel, but celebrating the franchise as a whole. The Michael one-take killing sequence is straight out of Halloween 2, but it also has the masks from 3, the dumb cops from 5, the stupidity of resurrection, and the various other homages I mentioned above. But they also feel the need to just do exactly what the original did, like the stupid wall pin and the ghost costume. We're 11 movies into this, miss me with that shit. The characters are hit or miss, but mostly because of the aforementioned one-offs that are just there to be killed. I'll admit I like Julian, the little boy being babysat, and I actually like Allison and Karen, but Allison's boyfriend and his cheating story is so contrived and only exists for plot convenience. And speaking of plot convenience, boy do I hate Dr. Sartain's stupid plan. Is he on a random path or is he emotionally driven, triggered by something? Perhaps some unheard marching order imprinted on his very being. Oh, you mean like Halloween 6? While the movie does the right thing by having Michael return to just being a motiveless killer, Dr. Sartain's entire existence is just to get Michael and Laurie to reunite. Michael couldn't give two shits about Laurie in this timeline, so they had to come up with some shoehorned way to get them together. And Dr. Sartain literally just drives him to her, before getting his head bashed in, of course. Say something. I took this obsession with the podcasters and Dr. Sartain trying to get Michael to talk as a reference to Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, where he does speak, Die. and Michael bashing in Dr. Sartain's head as a way to say he's not going to. But I could be reading too much into it. As we gear up for the final showdown, another issue rears its ugly head. The movie is not scary. Michael is scary again, this time, played by James Jude Courtney, but the movie itself isn't scary. I understand the whole the hunter becomes the hunted thing, with Laurie's house being laden with booby traps, but it doesn't feel as triumphant as H2O. In fact, it feels a lot more like Home Alone. Hello. Lori and Michael both fuck each other up pretty good. Lori shooting Michael's fingers off, and Michael stabbing Lori pretty bad. Even Allison gets a good lick in with the knife. There's a nice scene where Karen is in the cellar and tricks Michael by pretending to be weak, only to shoot him and luring him into the cellar. Lori lighting the house on fire, trapping Michael once and for all. Yeah, burn him, like that stopped him before. Lori, Allison, and Karen escape and hitch a ride on the back of a pickup truck, similar to the ending of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, with Allison still holding the bloody knife. I heard people speculate that this was another Jamie situation, where theoretically she could now become the killer, but I always took it as, unlike Lori, Allison doesn't drop the knife, but I'm not entirely sure. This movie is... Fine. I think I had a similar reaction when I talked about Halloween 4. Halloween 4 is... Fine. Which this movie reminds me a lot of. It apes a lot from almost every movie that came before it. Which I wouldn't mind so much if this was a send-off and the final film in the franchise. It wasn't. On the next Halloween... They could never leave well enough alone, could they? Halloween Kills was announced nine months after the release of Halloween 2018, which was a huge success. It was initially set to be filmed back to back with the third film, Halloween Ends, and released in October 2020. However, due to the worldwide pandemic, Kills was filmed on its own and pushed back to October 2021. And guys, this one? is hilariously bad. I also saw this one in theaters, and I just remember everyone in the theater laughing, including myself. And the lead up to it was just as baffling. On the awkward COVID press tour, Jamie Lee Curtis compared the mob mentality themes in Halloween Kills to the Black Lives Matter movement. It takes on what happens when trauma infects an entire community, and we're seeing it everywhere with the Black Lives Matter movement. Please, for God's sake, please stop it. And Halloween Kills, weirdly enough, dovetailed onto that, preceded it. Stop it. And again, I want to remind everybody, it was pre-Black Lives Matter movement. Stop it. And yet, the same activity takes over in Halloween Kills. Stop it. It's a masterpiece. Stop it. <laughs> 
Did I mention that Jamie Lee Curtis is fucking weird? I invented Instagram. I feel like she's mentally and physically incapable of being a normal person. Growing up the child of two famous actors, Janet Lee and Tony Curtis, you should watch her interviews about everything everywhere all at once, or even her documentary that was included on the 4K of the original Halloween, just to get a better idea of what I'm talking about. But also, last thing before I move on, at the premiere of Halloween Ends, the producers invited Danielle Harris and Scout Taylor Compton, and they met Jamie Lee Curtis at the after party. And according to their podcast, Talk Scary to Me, she was incredibly rude to them. Harris explained that she introduced herself, saying she played Curtis's character's daughter in Halloween's 4 and 5. And she just said, um, yeah, I've, I, I, I don't watch those movies. I've never seen those movies. I don't watch them. I don't know who you are. I was just like, oh, okay, um... I just didn't know how to continue the conversation because when you're sort of like cut off, how do you then say, well, <laughs> can I continue to tell you how awesome I think you are? You know, it was just sort of like, I don't, I don't, I don't. Okay, next. I'm sorry, I don't know you. I'm not going to tell my my story because I'm already getting emotional. And I'm, oh my God, fuck. <laughs> I'm such a crybaby. I was like the same encounter, but me just saying that I played Laurie Strode. We just left feeling very, very hurt. And look, I don't like the sequels or the Rob Zombie movies, but I need to make it clear, again, I have nothing against the actors in them. And I feel awful for these two. They've been waiting to meet her. She's a fucking idol, man. And she's just gonna act like that? Maybe she was having a bad day? I don't know, it's still no excuse. So why am I talking about this and not Halloween Kills? If you think I've been stalling, then you'd be right. Halloween Kill starts where the 2018 film left off, with Allison's boyfriend Cameron now having an expanded role. He finds Officer Hawkins, a minor character in the previous film, still somehow alive after being stabbed in the neck, then ran over by Dr. Sartain. We then get a flashback to 1978, taking place shortly after the original film. We see a younger Hawkins, who's told, Loomis said he shot him multiple times in the chest. No, he shot, shot him six, six times. times. We're given new Michael Myers lore, and can we stop it with the lore? It only serves to make Michael less interesting. So I guess Michael wants to return home to stare out of his sister Judith's window, for stupid reasons we'll get into later. We're then reintroduced to Lonnie Elam, a minor character who picked on Tommy Doyle in the original film, his role now expanded to secondary lead. Because they're continuing to run out of ideas, he runs into Michael, and right away, we're seeing the kind of silliness that persists throughout the movie. Where is he? Who? Oh. Man. We do get a pretty great recreation of the Myers house, unlike whatever the fuck that was in Halloween 5, but my praises end there, because once again we see a dead dog. Michael, who's supposed to be 21 yet has dad bod, then attacks one of the cops, and Hawkins accidentally fatally shoots his partner, trying to get to Michael. For some reason, Michael doesn't kill Hawkins, and instead makes his way outside, only to be surrounded by the rest of the police force. And if the movie couldn't get any worse already, Loomis shows up. I appreciate that he's not a deepfake CGI nightmare like Grand Moff Tarkin, but his voice is all wrong. What happened in here? Did Michael kill again? We get the opening credit pumpkins again, but there's so many of them, reminding me of the Disney, look, there's more, so it's better trope. At least John Carpenter's music still kicks ass. We then cut back to 2018, and we're faced with one of the movie's biggest problems, the characters. There's Lindsay, the little girl Lori was babysitting in 1978, and actually played by the same actress, Kyle Richards. There's Nurse Marion, who, why is she hanging out with people half her age? Her connection with Michael is that he stole her car. Ooh. Then we have a grown-up Lonnie Elam, and the boy he bullied in the original film, Tommy Doyle, who, instead of being played by Paul Rudd, is played by Anthony Michael Hall, and the movie is worse off for it. He, like literally everyone in this movie, is a raving lunatic that's still obsessed with Michael Myers 40 years later. Essentially, they all talk like Dr. Loomis, and not just any Dr. Loomis, Halloween 5 Dr. Loomis. It's a little bizarre that this film takes place in a new continuity set up by the last film, but when talking about the death of Annie, they show clips from the now out of continuity Halloween 2. It's entirely possible that this would have happened the same way, and I'm well aware that this is just a nit 
nitpick, but it's strange nonetheless. So how does Michael survive the fire from the end of the last movie? Well, these firefighters show up, and Michael emerges from hiding in the gun vault in the basement. How did Lori not think of that? I mean, she's supposed to be the survivalist who thinks of everything. So this is one hell of an oversight. Though I have to admit, Michael emerging from the burning building is a really cool visual. Even if it's followed by him unrealistically murdering the group of firefighters. And oh joy, we get more of David Gordon Green's stupid nothing characters that are quirky then killed. Maybe he thought putting this drone playing couple in would distract us from the fact that this is still very much like Halloween 2. Because of her fight with Michael in the last movie, Lori is taken to the hospital, where she'll be confined for the rest of the movie. <sighs> Just like Halloween 2. And I'm gonna be honest, guys. I'm running out of steam here. I thought by watching all these fucking things that it'd be fun. But it's not. It's exhausting. Can you hear my voice? It's going fucking hoarse. Charles Cyphers returns as Sheriff Brackett, and just like me, he looks tired. And even though Lori undergoes a pretty heavy-duty operation, she's up walking and talking later in the movie, so how does that make sense? Also, with Officer Hawkins, it's the same deal, so it begs the question, what time is it anyway? This all takes place on the same night, yet there's so much going on. There's this subplot where another inmate escaped along with Michael Myers, and because most people don't know what Michael looks like, the citizens are whipped into a friend when they hear that Michael was on the loose and killing people. And this sparks the meme-worthy line that's laughably repeated throughout the film. Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! Or evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! But it doesn't make any sense, okay? It's fucking stupid. And I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but this angry mob is incredibly reminiscent to the mob who hunts down Michael in Halloween 4. Also, wait, they showed Michael's face on the news, so there's no way they think this Wallace Shawn looking ass is Michael Myers. Inconceivable! Whatever. Allison and Cameron decide to join Lindsay, Marion, and this new couple. I guess Allison just forgiving Cameron for that contrived kiss in the last film. I do like the idea of having the Myers house no longer being abandoned, and being completely renovated. Though I don't know if I like the couple that lives in the house now, Big John and Little John. I don't know, something about them feels offensive, but I might be thinking about this more than Danny McBride did. Also, how are there no cops outside of the Myers house, with everything that's been happening tonight? Oh, and look, the kids are wearing the silver shamrock masks, and they're referencing the razor blade bit from Halloween 2. Double whammy. Lindsay and the gang run into the Silver Shamrock kids, who then all start getting picked off by Michael in hilariously stupid ways. <laughs> Lindsay manages to escape Michael's grasp, and because they ran out of things to recreate from the original Halloween films, they decide to rip off Lord of the Rings. Lori and Frank share a quiet scene where they profess that they like each other, but he never made a move because, even into her 20s, she was still into Ben Tramer. Let's just hope he didn't meet the same fate as his Halloween 2 counterpart. Because Karen believes Michael is coming after her mother, Tommy riles up the hospital crowd. We have watched your department fail. Fail tonight! I get that they're trying to do some kind of social commentary, but it all falls flat. And the dialogue is so poorly written that it's comical. He killed my daughter 40 years ago. And desecrated her body. Evil dies tonight! God damn it! The other inmate makes his way into the hospital, and for some reason, they all think he's Michael Myers. It all becomes headache inducingly chaotic, with everyone chasing him, and, despite Karen's best efforts, the terrified inmate throws himself out of the hospital window. Oh, come on! Did we have to see his mangled corpse? Now he's turning us into monsters. Yeah, I got that, thanks. Enough negativity, let's talk positive. Pro, Frank informs Lori that Michael isn't after her and has no motive. Con, remember how earlier they added that new Michael lore? Well, they theorized that Michael wasn't looking, looking out. Maybe he was looking in at his reflection, at himself. They're trying to add psychology to Michael Myers like Rob Zombie did, and it still doesn't work, stop doing that. Later, Lonnie, Cameron, and Allison make it to the Myers house, after Michael came home and killed the gay couple. There's a scene in the original where young Lonnie goes up to the Myers house and is dared to go inside, but Loomis, who's hiding behind a bush, scares him out of it. Lonnie, get your ass away from there. How bad can I be? I'm just doing 
doing what comes naturally. Well, they're turning that into a character moment for Lonnie, who now needs to prove to himself that he's not too scared to enter the Myers house. And he heroically, oh, he died. Michael then proceeds to kill Cameron, but Karen comes in the nick of time to save Allison, stealing Michael's mask and luring him to the angry mob. It's Halloween. Everyone's entitled to one good scare. Why did he say that? I know it's his line from the original film. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? But how does it make sense in context here? So the mob beats the shit out of him, but that's never stopped Michael before, and he just murders Tommy, Sheriff Brackett, and everyone else with relative ease. In the original, he's vaguely supernatural, but here, it's blatant. He would not have been able to survive otherwise. He's basically just Jason at this point. Michael then disappears into the night, or so we think, and Karen, for some reason, decides she wants to look out Judith's window to see what Michael sees. I thought they were going for a Halloween 4 callback, maybe hinting at Karen becoming the new Michael Myers. But no, Michael just kills her, yet somehow the police downstairs don't hear any of this, and that's how the movie ends. Fear. People are afraid. That is the true curse of Michael. Oh, I thought that was the Thorn Cult. This was my second time seeing this movie, and I liked it about as much as I liked it the first time, which was not really at all. I did watch the extended cut this time around, having already seen the theatrical cut in theaters, go figure. But the only new scene that stood out to me was Laurie calling Karen at the end, and Michael picking up, that being a callback to the original film. This one's going pretty low on my list. Nothing about this movie is original, especially in the context of the franchise. It did spark my interest in seeing Halloween ends though, if only to see how much worse it could be. <sighs> We're in the home stretch now, guys, only one more to go. Halloween Ends came out a few weeks ago at the time of me making this video, and when I heard the title, I just scoffed. Yeah, Halloween Ends, just like Friday the 13th claimed it was ending. Twice. Jason Blum even said as much, saying that even though this was the last Blumhouse Halloween film, the Akkad still had plans to make more down the line. It's just a bit odd that, in the new Blumhouse logo, it includes Michael Myers. Jeremy and I went to go see this opening weekend, in IMAX no less, even though this movie wasn't filmed in IMAX, it was still cool to see a John Carpenter adjacent film on the biggest screen possible, if not just to hear his incredible score. But, like Philly D would say, let's, let's just, just jump, jump into it. it. What did I think of Halloween Ends? I thought it was pretty good. I guess that's a divisive opinion. Most people seem to hate this movie. I guess I can understand why. This is the third and final film in an admittedly makeshift trilogy, and they're forcing you to follow an entirely new character for most of it. But I don't know. A lot of it worked for me. This film opens with a scene that, on its own, would make a pretty great short horror film. The movie introduces us to Corey Cunningham, a 21-year-old boy who's called upon to babysit for this wealthy family. It is a bit silly that his name is Corey, which rhymes with Lori, but he reminds me more of Arnie from John Carpenter's Christine, even sharing his last name. Arnie Cunningham. Actually, a lot of the movie reminds me of Christine, but we'll get into that in a bit. It's explained that it's been a year since Michael's disappearance, and the family's son, Jeremy, is supposedly afraid that Michael is still out there. Whether or not he actually is afraid is called into question when Corey and Jeremy are watching the Thing remake, and Jeremy is acting like a little shit. I don't really feel like pretending to be best friends with an ugly ass boy babysitter. Jokes aside, in the original and Rob Zombie's Halloween, the characters watched The Thing from the 1950s, so I can't believe it actually took them this long for the characters to watch the John Carpenter Thing remake. We're also introduced to something every film since Halloween 3 has been lacking. Subtlety. We get to know Corey a bit without any dialogue. He's told to help himself to anything in the fridge, so he almost chooses a beer, but responsibly goes for the chocolate milk. Before he can enjoy it though, a commotion is heard, and Jeremy is nowhere to be found. Could Michael have broken in? Corey makes his way up to the top floor, only for everything to be a cruel prank by Jeremy. Then, this happens. What was that? Ah! Jeremy! No, please! Oh my God! Oh, please, no! Oh, 
Holy fuck, what an opening! In the theater, everyone gasped and then cheered as John Carpenter's classic score kicked in. Three years later, Corey is found innocent, but after having no resolve to the Michael Myers situation, Haddonfield has turned Corey into their new scapegoat, shunning him and treating him like a monster. Haddonfield actually feels more realized than ever before. There's an underlying rot in the town, and the lack of closure reminds me a lot of Twin Peaks The Return, which I'm not sure is intentional. I incorrectly attributed the blue italicized font to Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, but then I realized it was an homage to the font used in Halloween 3. I feel like a real idiot. Regardless, Corey is working at his stepfather's salvage yard, another Christine parallel, but with Corey wearing a jumpsuit similar to Michael's. And much like Peter Parker, he can't even catch a break to buy some chocolate milk, with the store's clerk and even some high school students harassing him. After refusing to buy them alcohol, the bullies continue to egg Corey on. You're that psycho babysitter. He killed that kid, didn't he? So where's your next victim? What, what oh, the oh, fuck oh, you oh, Laurie Strode sees the uproar and gets them to leave Corey alone. So do you want to do it? Or you want me to? Lori then takes Corey to the hospital, where Allison now works. Corey and Allison hit it off right away, with both of them feeling like outcasts. We should go out sometime and do something. With me? With both of us. I mean, we both have to be there, otherwise it wouldn't be a very good time. I thought the relationship started off pretty cute. And, but where is Michael Myers? Who the fuck cares? We'll get there, but who cares? This is awesome. There's another cute scene where Lori and Deputy Hawkins run into each other at a grocery store, revealing Hawkins suggested Lori write a book about her experiences. But all the charm is cut short when Lori is confronted by the sister of the drone lady from the previous film. Holy shit, she survived? It's actually a harrowing scene. We see her scars, and she's now unable to speak. And her sister, like the rest of Haddonfield, placed the blame on Lori for Michael's actions. Allison invites Corey to a Halloween party at the bar that Lindsay now works at, even running into a Nick Castle cameo. And when he starts to open up and enjoy himself, he's confronted by Jeremy's mother, who brings him back to his harsh reality. Shunned, he leaves Allison and runs into the bullies again, who throw him off the overpass. He's then dragged into a sewage pipe by none other than Michael Myers. But there's something different about Michael. He's weak, having been weakened by the events of Halloween Kills. And it's almost like Michael sees all the evil that Haddonfield has projected onto Corey and seems to transfer his own evil into him. Corey then crawls into the light, reborn, the evil starting to consume him. And that's something else I liked about this film, the themes of infection and transformation. We see signs of it early on, with Jeremy's mask being a werewolf, and the opening pumpkins changing from inside the other pumpkins. We see Corey slowly changing into what Haddonfield already thinks he is. His first victim is this homeless man who jumps him immediately after exiting Michael's lair. It starts Corey down this dark path of no return. And I think it makes a lot of sense that Laurie can see the shift in Corey's eyes. Yeah, the bush shot is a little on the nose, but thematically, it adds up. He starts opening up more to Allison, showing her Jeremy's family's abandoned home. <laughs> I'm surprised they showed restraint and didn't do a slow rendition of the Halloween theme. And, because of their mutual, unfortunate circumstances, they wish to leave Haddonfield behind. Allison herself has had a rough couple of years, her parents being killed, keeping Lori together, and getting passed up on a promotion at work, and having this annoying douchebag cop ex who won't leave her alone. After Corey stands up to the cop for Allison, he follows Corey to start trouble, but Corey lures him into Michael's hideout. Corey then helps the weakened Michael kill the cop. This evil act seems to rejuvenate Michael. And for me, this is the point of no return for Corey. The kid who used to mow our lawn didn't kill my son. I know that. But the guy I saw on the side of the road was down a dark path. Did the town do this to him after the accident? Or was it always there? It's incredibly sad to see him give in to evil. And I think this parallels Christine again. But instead of an evil car, it's Michael Myers. He then hunts down the doctor and nurse, brutally murdering the doctor, but leaving the nurse to Michael. 
Now, while I do like Corey as the new antagonist for this film, I feel like everything that doesn't work is when it needs to be a Halloween movie. We get yet another stupid wall pin, the sewing needle, the setup, and the whole ending in general. But we'll get there when we get there. John Carpenter's score is incredible, and I love how this movie feels like an homage to Carpenter's work as a whole, rather than just recreating Halloween. It also feels very David Lynch, like the aforementioned Twin Peaks The Return, but also Lost Highway, and the choices in dreamy music. After encountering Michael, Corey started staying in the abandoned house, sleeping on the spot where Jeremy died. We see, throughout the film, that Corey's mother is an unnerving, overprotective weirdo, so that's another possibility, I guess. Lori attempts to talk to Corey about the evil that's consuming him, not only to protect her granddaughter, but to help him, but Corey angrily turns her away. I feel like it's left ambiguous whether or not Lori was actually there, or if she was a representation of the good that's still in him. Now, this is where the cracks in the movie start to show. Corey fighting Michael for his mask is kinda silly, especially how it's framed like a Scooby-Doo chase montage. Corey dressed as Michael getting his revenge on the bullies is a lot of fun though, with refreshingly creative kills, and actually feels cathartic because we've seen them fucking with Corey throughout the entire film. And, unlike Friday the 13th Part 5, the copycat killer plot here actually works. Corey then hunts down his mother, and the town radio DJ, who is a bit of a one-dimensional character. But his kill was so fun and inventive that I couldn't help but have the sadistic smile on my face. Also, the song playing during that scene was I Was a Teenage Werewolf by The Cramps, furthering the themes of change that I mentioned before. But sprinkled throughout these fun scenes are the setup for the lame, tacked-on ending. After an incredibly contrived argument with Allison, Lori calls in a suicide? This is all just a ruse to get the cops to come over and bait Corey. Did you really think I'd kill myself? I just don't get why she didn't just call the police because someone was trying to kill her, instead of doing this somewhat tasteless fake-out. The resolution to Corey's story feels so rushed, Lori just shooting him, and him stabbing himself to frame Lori for his death, which for some reason works on Allison, even though he's clearly dressed like Michael Myers, and his mask is right there on the floor. Seriously, that didn't tip you off? Then Michael shows up, and Corey fruitlessly fights him off, which I took as the the good in him being his ultimate undoing, but that was just my interpretation. I could be completely wrong about that. And this is where the movie officially falls apart, by becoming the movie that was promised. We finally get the final showdown between Lori and Michael Myers for the first time. If you don't count H2O, or even this universe as Halloween 2018. It's just a lame action sequence. And aren't they supposed to be like 70? It's all just so goofy. When Lori does incapacitate him, Michael still tries to choke her out, and it looks like they're going to kill each other. Then we're given flashbacks that remind me of Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2, and that's the last thing you want to be thinking about when watching a supposedly serious horror movie. Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2. Michael somehow survives long enough for Allison to come back and deliver the final blow. We then get the silly, overly sentimental police procession with the curtain call of all your favorite characters from the trilogy, all coming to see Michael's corpse get thrown into a giant meat grinder. And I'm just sitting here wondering how they're gonna retcon this in five years. Allison leaves Haddonfield on her own accord, and Laurie decides to start a romance with Deputy Hawkins as the movie Halloween ends. The ending completely ruined the movie for me, but I do think the first two thirds are pretty solid. Most of the complaints that I've seen center around Michael barely being in it, and being a weak conclusion to the trilogy, which I get, but I give it props for trying to be its own thing. I found the tragedy of Corey compelling, and even if you wanted to interpret the film literally, with no literal transference of evil, you could view it as Corey was pushed then snapped, feeling like he had nothing more to lose. I liked the look of the movie, I loved the soundtrack, and even though I thought the ending was super weak, I don't know, I can't in good conscience say it's the worst of the series like some people are claiming. Not when there's movies like Halloween 5. I'm putting this one below Halloween 2, but above Halloween 2018. It's definitely the best of the David Gordon Green trilogy, and a surprising breath of fresh air to end this review on.
ranking these movies was surprisingly hard to do. I did this with the Illumination films a few years ago, and I ran into a similar problem, that being the general sameness of a lot of the entries. I've moved around the ranking a lot getting up to this point, and after writing and watching and months of editing, I think I got it. In last place, we've got Halloween 5, which, if you've been watching, it should come as no surprise. This wasn't the first movie to change Michael's motives, but it was the first one to give him emotions, specifically anger and sadness. Couple that with Crazy Loomis, Cookie Woman, Cookie Woman, the worst Michael mask, and the Myers Plantation, you get a weak film that's too long and too boring to recommend. In 12th place, I've got Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Both cuts. Whereas Halloween 5 made me angry, Curse left me confused. And that's something I learned about myself. I'd rather be confused than angry, I guess. The Thorn Cult doesn't work, and a bafflingly charmless Paul Rudd make Curse an interesting anomaly. In 11th place, I've got Halloween Resurrection. Most people I see ranking these movies have this one at the bottom, which I totally get, because at least Halloween 5 has some elements that are staples of the franchise. But Resurrection scores a few points for me by virtue of just being a time capsule of the early 2000s post-Blair Witch world. I can at least have an ounce of fun with this one, but it's still bad. Side note, when I started filming all this, I was waiting for the 4K set for these three movies to arrive because I wanted to give each movie its fair shake. That was a mistake. Feel this. In 10th place, I've got Halloween 4. It's not great. And I feel like I'm running out of ways to say, it's not great. It's a bit too formulaic, and I think I dislike it more for what it took away from us. That is, the anthology idea. But it's got that sibling dynamic between Jamie and Rachel that I enjoyed, and it features that hillbilly mob that kills Stoll. But they're much more endearingly stupid here, so I don't know. In ninth place, I've got Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Nothing about this movie works. It's a nonsensical, overly stylized, confused film that seems to mistake Michael Myers with Jason Voorhees. I give Rob Zombie credit for trying to do something new here, but for me, it just fell flat. Well, except for Cool Loomis, but he doesn't want my opinion. When I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. Promise? <laughs> In 8th place, I've got Halloween Kills, which, unlike the other five movies that I've ranked, I can at least watch this one and laugh. It's so stupid and falls harder on its face with its social commentary than Mr. Tavoli. It makes the 2018 film feel extra hollow by comparison, basically because the entire ending was a complete waste of time. Next. You thought I was going to throw that, didn't you? This is a 4K set. I paid good money for this. In seventh place, I've got Rob Zombie's Halloween. My teenage nostalgia didn't do this movie any favors. It's sloppy, ugly, and overall misses a lot of what makes the original scary. And he was too big. In sixth place, we've got Halloween 2018. We're starting to get into the decent ones now, but like I said before, my enjoyment of it has diminished over time. It's basically the franchise equivalent of The Force Awakens, having just enough new flavor to be fun, but is ultimately bogged down by telling the same story again. In fifth place, I've got Halloween Ends. If it wasn't for that fucking ending, man. This is, by and large, the best of the new trilogy, and works best when it's doing its own thing. But when it reminds you that it's a Halloween movie, that's when it starts to fall apart. I really do hope that Rowan Campbell gets work after this. He really killed it, no pun intended. In fourth place, I've got Halloween 2. Y'all are probably hating me right about now because I've seen most people having this at number 2. But for me, this movie is number 2. <laughs> In all seriousness, I didn't like this one a whole lot, but the craft, music, and overall atmosphere saved the movie for me. Plus, I really like that bleeding eye imagery. In third place, I've got Halloween H2O. Wow! Sorry! That one caught me by surprise. Yeah, the one I was dreading the most became my third favorite. Again, not all of it works. Michael's mask keeps changing, and they all look terrible. But I felt like this version of Lori was more engaging than her 2018 counterpart. You win this time, Steve Miner. In second place, I've got Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. My cards are kind of on the table here, but let's pretend like they're not, just for one second. 
Halloween 3 is so much fun, and I'm so happy that it's found its audience all these years later. Sure, it's not perfect, far from it, but you can tell that everyone involved cared, and their excitement is infectious through the screen. Plus, I love those silver shamrock masks, and I'm so glad I finally got my hands on them this year. And in first place, shockingly, is the original John Carpenter classic. Yeah, that's probably not so original, is it? But let me assure you, there's plenty of franchises where the original film is not the best. But here, it couldn't be any more true. It spawned so many imitators because the audience really responded to it. So much care went into the small, simple movie. And honestly, I can't sing its praises enough. So am I gonna watch most of these again? <laughs> No, it's not so much that I grew to hate the franchise, more so that I just grew so tired of it. But that's not going to stop me from watching Halloween's 1 and 3 every year. And hey, maybe I'll even watch two more, if not just to get to H2O. The jury's still out if I'm going to watch the new trilogy, mostly because I didn't particularly like the first two, but Ends was surprisingly enjoyable. But who knows? Maybe I will revisit them, if not just to hear John Carpenter's soundtracks. I actually met John Carpenter at Amoeba Music in 2018 for a signing of the new film soundtrack. I still have that signed vinyl hanging up on my wall. It means a lot to me. Look at this, she hates this. Anyway, I hope you all had an awesome spooky season. I know Maya and I did, and <laughs> Daniel just texted me. Holy shit, he's in trouble! Oh! <laughs> Spooked you. Well, I guess you proved me wrong. Also, I wrote you a little jingle to close us out. Okay, let it rip. Goes like this. Stop it, please, for God's sake, please stop it. There's no more time. Please stop it, turn it off. Please stop it. 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 Stop it! Special thanks to Big Drippy, Rukix, Robith, Call Up Hugh Hefner, you gay boy bunny, Catherine, and Shara for your continued support on Patreon. And thank you for making it to the end of this two hour long video. Also, extra special thanks to Daniel and Molly for being my first collaborators on my channel. I'll have all the respective links below, so definitely check them out. A lot of shit contributed to this video taking forever, like me moving into my own place. But I have several video ideas in the works, and I can't wait to get back into the swing of things. Until then, an extended cut of Jeremy Tabor and I watching Rob Zombie's Halloween will be uploaded later this week. But if you want to see it early, I have it up on Patreon. Patreon right now. So until next time, you can check me out on Daniel's second channel, Daniel Thrasher Plus, or follow me on my socials. And of course, like, subscribe, leave a comment pertaining to your favorite Halloween movie or whatever you think I should look at in the future. Let's -a go! I hate All those this. People, Chucky. Hey, what this is Daniel Thrasher. About? Wait, that is you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. Okay, I think we got, we got it. it. <laughs>